Captain, and Ed Schweiger. And we have uh, Lieutenant um, James, uh, James Ford. And And Lieutenant Paul Messier. And Lieutenant um, Mike. 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 Captain. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting. Thank you for coming. Uh, this has been part of our community engagement plan for the year that I've been here. Unfortunately, I'll, I will only be here for another three days because I've been promoted to Deputy Chief of Investigation. So this will be my last. <laughs> but the purpose of this meeting is problem solving. Um, we are having a huge issue with burglary. And that is a part, uh, priority for us in Southern Division. It has been. Our three major priorities have been burglaries, gangs, and quality of life. So that's what we're here to discuss, what we're doing uh, as a department. But I'm here to ask you for your help. It's because of your partnership, your eyes and ears, that we can be effective. And that's why we're here. So I'm going to defer to the mayor because he's going to speak. Then uh, uh, Councilman Camus is going to speak, our Assistant Chief is going to speak. And then I'm going to go through some of the stats and the data related to the Allen and Valley area. Good evening. Good evening. Everyone can hear that, right? Yeah. Good. My name is Sam Licardo, and it's my honor to serve you as mayor. I've been in office now uh, for about five and a half weeks. I'm going to stand right here and not move. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're good now. Uh, first, I want to let you know that as a former criminal prosecutor, uh, I know something about experiencing uh, and seeing the loss that happens when someone's been a victim of crime. And I can tell you as a homeowner who has been burglarized in this city uh, back in 2009, I believe, and then there was an attempted burglary, I think, the next year. Uh, I know something about the frustration uh, and the fear. My wife certainly was very fearful being at home for several months afterward. Uh, and there's not a lot you can say to someone uh, to console them when they don't feel safe being in their own home. So I appreciate very much there's a lot of frustration right now. And there's frankly nothing I'm going to say to those of you who have been victimized that's going to console you because you don't feel safe in your own home. But I want to tell you something about what we're learning and what we're doing. So first, what we're learning. What we know is, is uh, Chief Williams, soon to be Chief Williams, is going to tell you that there have been 103 arrests of burglaries in the Southern Division over the last eight months, I believe. What we've learned from those 103 burglary arrests, that is, arrests connected to burglaries in the Southern Division here, uh, that a very high percentage of those arrests have been uh, 14 to 17 year olds, teens, who have been gang affiliated. Not necessarily members of gangs, but teens who are being recruited by gangs to go burglarize homes. And so uh, we have not just a burglary problem, but a gang problem. And that's real. And so that's important to inform us about what our next steps are. Uh, I secondly, I wanted to let you know that what we're learning about burglaries in this city is that in the most effective of times, in the best of times, we have a lot of burglaries. I looked it up. The best year we've had for burglaries in this city was 2010, at least in the last quarter century. The lowest rate was in 2010. We had somewhere, I think, 3,500 or 3,600 burglaries that year. So if you do the math, that's about 10 burglaries a day somewhere in the city. That's a lot of burglaries. That was the best of times. 
We know we've got more now. And the good news is they've been dropping. Property crime has generally been dropping in the city for the last couple of years. But we've got a real spike in burglary here. As we've seen in the past, for instance, spikes in Evergreen and Westside. And I think the department uh, is going to tell you about what they've done in the past to combat burglary spikes. We've got a real spike here and it's a real problem. So first, let me tell you about what we're doing at the policy level. Because you've got a great council member here, Johnny Camus, who does not hesitate to tell me every day for the last two and a half months we've got a real burglary problem in my district. And I've been hearing that loud and clear from him just as I've been hearing from you. So rest assured, you've got a strong advocate. Uh, so Councilmember Camus and I have been working hard on focusing first on the problem that we all know is the elephant in the room, which is police staffing. Uh, we know we're severely depleted, we've got a real problem with morale, and we've got to do something about it. That's why two weeks ago we reached out to all of our bargaining unions, including the police union, to indicate clearly that we intend to renegotiate pension reform measure B, uh, we intend to renegotiate issues like disability, which are causing officers to want to leave and hurting our recruiting efforts, and then we want to get to the negotiating table right away. And today we released a letter in writing that lays out to all of our bargaining units our clear intent. What our goal is in terms of uh, how it is we're going to meet our service delivery needs and funding and what we're trying to negotiate toward and the fact that we're willing to, in fact, reduce our expectations for whatever savings we thought we could get out of Measure B and find other approaches. And we'll be talking a lot about that publicly over the next days and weeks. But first, I think you want, I need you all to know that we're working hard to do everything we can to get this resolved, to get to the negotiating table quickly, and get this dispute behind us so we can start hiring police officers again. Uh, secondly, uh, we are today, as we speak, installing LED lights throughout the southern part of the city and the eastern part of the city, new LED lights. Why is that important? Well, I think you all know from the yellow sulfur lights that you see out there, they're frankly not very good. We've had them for decades. They don't help you very much in terms of visibility. They are not much of a deterrent uh, to those criminals who like to lurk in dark places. Uh, so we are upgrading 18,000 LED street lights over uh, the last month and into the next two months. And then we're going out. Uh, to bid, and we're going to try to see if we can get the remaining 40,000 streetlights from the rest of the city. So the good news is you're in the southern part of San Jose, and we're uh, replacing your streetlights. And not only is it making it safer, we believe, it's also saving us a lot of money, and we can invest that money in restoring services like police. Third, uh, I think you're going to hear soon from the heads of our department uh, that we're working hard on what's called TABS, Truancy Abatement. Uh, this is a program that focuses on high school students. Why high school students? Well, I just told you that we're seeing a huge fraction of these burglaries associated with teenagers, 14 to 17 year olds. And what we know is that burglaries are disproportionately happening in the daytime, when those kids are supposed to have their butts in the seat in a classroom. And we know that there's a correlation between their absence in high school and burglaries and property crime that's happening in the daytime. And so the chief is committed to increase the use of overtime for officers uh, to expand our truancy abatement program to ensure we're keeping more of their butts in the seats where they're supposed to be so they're not out causing trouble. And that's a good thing for lots of reasons. Obviously, it helps keep us safer and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be so they, we have a better chance of see if we can provide an opportunity or they can have an opportunity uh, to thrive in this valley because we know they can't do that without education. And it also helps our school districts who generate revenue when students are in class. And finally, something Council Member Camus and I have been working very hard on and we're launching today is a citywide security camera registry. Now, what's this all about? Well, you probably heard about this in the news. This is a simple device. You can go online, www.sanjoseca.gov slash security camera, and you'll, uh, I'm sure you'll hear more about in the news in the next day or two, where you can sign up if you've got a video camera at your home or your business. 
And the point of this is to enable police officers to know if there has been a crime in your neighborhood, somewhere nearby, they can quickly look, hopefully at a Google map, when all this is uh, geotagged, be able to clearly identify someone nearby who they can call, who may be able to allow them access to look at videotape to identify suspects, or to identify a license plate on a car. Uh, we have seen this used in other cities. It's being used now in Fremont, Philadelphia, in about a year period of time. They used it in over 200 arrests. We know this can work if it's used effectively. Uh, we'll be launching this. Hopefully, we've been working out the bugs, and hopefully those bugs are worked out, but we'll need your help, obviously, in participation. And so if you have a security camera, please sign up online. Again, www.sanjoseaca.gov slash security camera, and obviously, Customer Armed Cameras and I and the PD will be doing all we can to get that information out. Now, over, that's the short term. Uh, in the long term, we've got a lot of plans, and you'll hear a lot about this. But one thing you know that happened this week that we're working on for this summer is jobs for teens. Uh, Father Boyle famously said in L.A., he was a strong uh, uh, leader in gang prevention, that the best way to stop the bullets is with the job. Uh, and we know that's effective through our Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, where we've been able to get at-risk teens involved in jobs, and they're not doing what they're not supposed to be doing in the summer, we're all better off. So the county has gone on bit, gone in big, they've committed a million dollars. That will hopefully get us about 500 jobs for at-risk teens. Uh, I have pledged that we're going to match that on the city side, and we're going to get 1,000 at-risk teens jobs. And we've been working hard on this, and we'll continue to work hard on it in the coming weeks and months. And we'd love to have your participation. Uh, we're starting working group meetings on March 5th, and they're open to the public. Uh, we will also be hiring 28 community service officers this year. Community service officers are not police officers. They are individuals who go through the academy, do not have guns, do not have badges, but can respond, for example, to low-level offenses or, for example, to burglaries where we know the suspect is obviously not there. Most burglaries occur uh, and are reported hours after the, the occurrence. And so by that point, what we need is someone to collect fingerprints and identify what's been lost, right? That's where a community service officer can help to get data into a database, can help us match crimes, and hopefully help us solve crimes and ultimately bring prosecutions uh, for heavier sentences when they get to the DA's office. And finally, we'll be working uh, on getting dating analytics Predict, specifically predictive policing up and running in the weeks ahead. My understanding is the vendor has been identified by the police department. Uh, this is essentially computer software that helps us better deploy officers anticipating where hot spots of crime are to enable us to better deploy officers in anticipation and obviously create a better deterrence. Uh, so I've had a lot of conversations with the chief and the deputy chief about this. We're assistant chief. Is that right, Eddie? All right, assistant chief. I always get the titles wrong. And we're going to uh, ensure they have the resources they need to make this work. Because we know we don't have enough officers. We need force multipliers in our neighborhoods until we get the number of officers we all need. And so we're going to work to ensure that we can get those force multipliers in place. So we've got a lot of work to do. I know, I know I've spoken uh, too long already. I'll stop. I just want to assure you, you've got a hardworking council member here who's going to do everything he can to ensure that your neighborhoods are safe. And perhaps more importantly, you've got a great department here. We don't have enough officers, but the officers we've got are working very hard. They're working a lot of overtime, and they're doing everything they can. And so I hope when you see them, you'll thank them, uh, because know that they're working hard for you. Thank you. All right, my, my speech won't be as, as long because I want to make sure that we can get enough time in for questions and whatnot, but I want to thank all each and every one of you for coming. Um, I, I have been a very squeaky wheel around City Hall making sure that we get the services that we need, and I want to make sure that you know that this. Uh, I've been uh, very thankful to Mayor Licardo, Assistant Chief Eddie Garcia, Captain Shawnee Williams, and, uh, and, and incoming Southern Division Captain Ed Schroeder, uh, Ray Cedeno and especially Susie Chang for uh, for helping us put this uh, event together and being a, 
uh, a person who uh, doesn't doesn't feel depressed when they they uh, experience uh, uh, you know and, and something wrong in their life. And she, she fought and she, she she helped us put this entire event together. I want to thank her very much. I also want to. Um, give a shout out here to District Attorney uh, uh, Johnny Gogo, who's also in the audience. Um, members of Don Rocha's office, the mayor's staff, uh, Margaret Abekoga from Den and Dennis Chu from Assembly Member Evan Lowe's office, and uh, uh, Pierre Luigi Oliverio, council member, is also in the audience. I just thank you all for for all um, um, showing up today and and helping um, listen and listening to our community's concerns. I, I I want to you know to work together. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to work together collaboratively uh, to make our neighborhood safer. And I want you to know that I think that one burglary is too many. Um, many of you may know or may not know that I personally have been a victim of uh, a home invasion uh, burglary. I was actually uh, it was a, it was a long time ago. It was uh, 19 years ago when I first purchased my house. I didn't have drapes, but I. Um, was sleeping upstairs and, and uh, a burglar stuck in my house, took about $3,000 worth of, uh, of my, my belongings, left. Uh, but a couple months later, our, our, our boys in blue caught, caught that person. And in fact, they told me that I'm glad, they were glad that I was asleep and that I didn't confront him because the guy was caught with guns. Um, and so I want to make sure that you know that I personally feel uh, very connected to what you guys are feeling. Um, since I took office, uh, I've actually encouraged residents to do a lot of neighborhood watch meetings. Um, uh, uh, we have crime prevention uh, meetings. Uh, we've had literally dozens of them, and I've worked with Ray Cedeno, and I've attended every single one that I could. And um, I, if you want to, uh, to put one together in your own neighborhoods, especially the people who have been burglarized, you, you should use this opportunity to, to get to know your neighbors, and I think that's one of the best ways to deter criminals. I actually had the pleasure of um, being in a neighborhood uh, community meeting, a neighborhood watch meeting last week in a small neighborhood that has never been burglarized over the last 15 years, but all of them knew each other. There was a couple of retirees on the block that actually looked out for the streets, called police when, when they saw suspicious vehicles in there, and I'm hoping that we can get to that, um, that level of understanding each other's neighbors. Um, I'm also, I want to also uh, let you know that I'm um, very, very, very supportive of Mayor uh, Licardo's direction um, on going with uh, bargaining with uh, and, and asking our unions to come to the table and help us bridge uh, our, um, our divide and making sure that we can attract the police officers and retain them. Um, I personally have reached out to the POA uh, on three occasions. I'm looking forward to meeting with them. And I wanted to let you know that uh, uh, you know I am very proud of the, the efforts that our the Southern Division captain um, and his team have done. I know that they have uh, captured several burglars in, uh, in December, and, and he's going to be telling you about more of the efforts that are going on. Um, so. I also want you to know that I'm very accessible. Some of the, some of the folks um, know and have visited me on, on my community open office hours. Uh, I am available. I have in district meetings. You can drop in and visit me anytime with any problem. And many of you do um, on Wednesdays uh, and Saturdays once a month. Uh, my flyer, they're probably all gone, but my flyers are at the table over there. And those of you who have um, signed up for my uh, newsletter, um, often receive reminders. Um, those of you who have not, please um, sign. I'm, I'm hoping that we can get all of your emails to keep you informed of all the activities that we're doing. Last year, last year uh, we held seven uh, workshops on cameras and did also two safety meetings. Um, the last camera workshop was only was so poorly attended we stopped doing it. So. Um, I, I wanted to let you know that we, we, we love to make sure that our, our community is educated about um, opportunities to make their safe, uh, neighborhood safer, and I'm willing to work with anybody who's, who wants to uh, put that together. Um, also, we have a website that you can learn safety tips. There's a beautiful video online that Ray Cedeno and the, and the SJPD put together that it's a must-see video. Those of you who have actually seen it, it gives you the, 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 the clearest, fastest way of the, five minutes that could change the way you do 
um, everything in your life to make your house a little more secure. That's also on the SJPD's website and my website, and that my website is sjd10.com. Um, and so we're, we're also trying to work with many community groups to set up uh, study sessions on, on surveillance te technology now. Um, my my, my midterm goals in the, in the, in the, in the middle, you know, midterm goals is to uh, work with Mayor Licardo and the, and the chief to, to provide more analytical tools uh, so that our police can actually uh, do some predictive uh, policing. I want to open the South San Jose substation for public, public activities and crime prevention training and report filing. Uh, many of you know that I, I, I championed that effort to make sure that we had funding to open the substation. Uh, we're training our police officers. Um, we have three uh, police academies run out of there every year now. Now that it's open, we're using it as a training facility. Um, I want to make, uh, I want to create more flexible flexibility in the use of um, reserve officers in many places throughout the city. The post service, post certified reservists uh, to help with traffic enforcement potentially. So I've been working with the chief on some ideas and to make sure that we can get more. Um, coverage in the area, and in the long run, I want to encourage uh, more um, the more successful re-entry programs and training and jobs for those released under Prop 47, Prop 36, and the realignment, which actually has released thousands of nonviolent offenders onto our community. And I'm hoping that our elected officials and in, um, in the uh, state will 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 hear us and have more of these programs to rehabilitate further. Uh, the prisoners that are being released onto our streets, um, some of which just end up in our homeless camps. And uh, I want to make sure that they are trained. I want to make sure that, that they uh, receive uh, jobs so that they, that they don't um, re-offend and recidivize. So um, that's one of the things that I've been uh, pushing uh, and will be pushing in the long run because I think that's a very long-term project. Um, I'm also very committed to restoring the specialized units and reopening um, the uh, policing centers. I got 30 seconds, I'll quit now. Thank you. Is that divided among the four shifts, basically, to have? 
Um, great question. I'm going to get to that. If I, how much time I got left? Please hold the questions until the end, please. All right, so in the next six minutes, I promise I'm going to get to that question. So what happens is, through that, then we have to give our investigations unit officers because we need to investigate crime. The biggest thing that I believe this group cares about, and I believe the entire city cares about, is really what our uniform patrol force is. Our uniform patrol force right now, we built a uniform patrol force that we want to have 500 officers in a uniform patrol force. Okay? We should have a lot more than 500 officers in our uniform patrol force. But even with the 500 officers that we set in our uniform patrol force, we don't have 500 officers. We have approximately 464 officers, okay? So what do we do to make up that difference? That difference is made up with officers that, are work, that work overtime. So that number, that difference, so let's say as an example, I did the math quickly, but let's say we need, uh, that's 36 positions a week that we need to back to the department in patrol. Now what's important to understand is when I say 36, that's 36 full-time employees that we need to backfill in patrol. Each employee in patrol is responsible for four 10-hour shifts. So you have to multiply that number by four. So in essence, that's 144 10-hour shifts that officers are working overtime for the city. And why that's important, it's imperative, as uh, the mayor said, your officers are working hard. I made mention earlier today in, a news, in, a, in an interview that I knew there'd be some frustration here. Uh, you're frustrated, we're frustrated for not being able to do what we wanted to do. Okay, but your officers that are here are working extremely, extremely hard. Now these numbers, okay, are divided. There are patrol forces divided into four divisions, Foothill Southern, Western and Central. Those divisions are divided into what are called districts. And then those districts are ultimately in these. Okay? So we have an entire city that we have to divide those 500 officers through all four divisions, 16 districts, seven days a week, and three different shifts a day. Now the shifts that we run are, we have a, a number of officers that start at six in the morning, to try to release some of the midnight officers, and they work till four, or three, or till four. We have another group that comes in, our major day shift that starts at uh, 6.30, work till 4.30. And another group that starts at, uh, that starts at from three in the afternoon, one, one in the morning, and then from nine o'clock at night, seven in the morning, midnight shift. Okay, I always tell our academy numbers, how many we have that, if there's X amount, I tell them, well, there's X amount of midnight officers, I can't wait for you to graduate, so please graduate. <laughs> At that point, I remember being a young a youngster in the academy, I didn't care you know, if I was working midnight. But we tell them all that because there are many officers that wait, wait for them to get out of the academy. So what, the is. so, what does that mean for us? Okay, what that means for us as a department, we have had to treat off. We have had to pick. We can't, we can, we can't do everything we want to do like we used to be able to. Okay? We have had to pick and choose, and we've had to keep priority crimes, and we've had to keep the crimes against persons as our number one priority. As our number one priority, our crimes against persons. And we've had to really have that, and that's how we built our department. You know, again, you're frustrated, we're frustrated. Uh, we remember, a lot of us that were here to remember that you can call the police, and there'd be a group, a team of officers down the street from your house if you had a problem neighbor. Okay? We know that we can't do that right now. And we hope to get back to that someday. We really do. You don't want excuses though. And I understand that. As a police department, we can't sit back and say, oh, we don't have staffing, so you know, let's go home. We know we can't do that. So what we have to do is we have to come up with some innovative ideas that have very little to do with staffing and have more to do with communication and have more to do with non-sworn and have more to do with, with overtime, quite frankly, to get, the, to get the job done and make you feel safe. Again, we want to do more, but your officers are doing right now everything that they can and they're answering the bell time and time again under some very difficult circumstances. 
Um, I would echo, when you see an Allstate, say thank you, because they're working their butts off. Not just for you, but for the entire city. Having said all that, we would be remiss, and one of the major reasons that we're here is because soon to be Deputy Chief, really took that long? Yeah. Uh, as soon as Deputy Chief Williams is going to tell you about the extraordinary work that the men and women of your police department have done in this community. And I think you'll be impressed by some of the things that you'll hear. I know there'll be many more questions of me and my staff uh, throughout this presentation. But with that, uh, Deputy Chief's going to be Deputy Chief Williams. you have seen some of this information, but I'm going to try to hurry through it. Uh, this is UCR data. Our chief wanted you to see the data uh, for the last two years. Uh, as you can see, it's a bar chart, and in yellow is the property crime for 2013, and in blue is the property uh, crime chart for 2014. You can see at the end there, it's starting to go up. Now, violent crime has relatively remain the same. That's that bottom line. Now this is our gang-related aggravated assault citywide from November to December, or I'm sorry, January 2015. Can you please speak up? Yes. <laughs> so the dots on the, the dots, the red dots, um, are areas where gang-related assaults have occurred. If you look at Southern Division, we had four gang-related that's your team for Southern Division, and those are your lieutenants and the Prime Division. Okay, now this is the division map for Southern Division. Now, Southern Division, as the Chief, Assistant Chief spoke, is divided into four districts. It's 123 square miles. Now, if you remember the first map, that was 179 square miles. So for Southern Division, it's well over 40-50% of the city. It's the large division, the largest in the city. And that's where we are. District Adam is the A, the A1, the A2, that's District Adam. Adam 5 is that large dark mass down here. I don't know if you can all see that, but that's where we are now. All right, community policing. I'm going to go through this really quick. It emphasizes proactive problem solving in partnership with the community. So the, the burglary problem, the gang problem, the robbery problem, all the problems that we deal with, we deal with it in partnership with you. That's why I'm so happy that everyone is here, because we do need your eyes. Now, the organizational transformation is what we're currently going through, the organizational structure. I'm going to go through what we do here in Southern Division and how we've divided our work. Our priorities are gangs, residential burglaries, and quality of life. Now, this is our operational chart, Operation Southside. That side is an acronym which stands for basically sharing information, yeah, exactly. intelligence, uh, analyzing the intelligence data, deploying resources, and E is for the evaluation. And that's where uh, you also come in, to evaluate our services. Our core competency, our, our emphasis is always on providing the best quality service that we can, and also reducing crime. So, as you can see, Lieutenant King, who's here on the right, is in charge of our burglary suppression effort, and also our contact and completion program. And contact and completion is when an officer gets a, a burglary case that we follow that up. And we follow that up if we have, say, a good lead, like a fingerprint or a license or someone who saw it and can give a description or video evidence. We try to follow those cases up to completion. And I'll talk about um, some of those cases in, uh, at the end of this presentation. Lieutenant Young is responsible for our community engagement plan. That means having meetings like this. He's responsible for helping us organize these types of meetings. Lieutenant Ford is in charge of our gang suppression efforts. Um, and Lieutenant Monahan, I'll talk about a little bit about that, about our racing uh, enforcement. And Ray Cedeno and Sonia Acevedo are responsible for our neighborhood watches, our community meetings, our education, our parent projects, and all those things that we do. 
Now these are the current tri uh, UCR data. Um, if you look, it's for November, December, and January, citywide. And on the right, it's the part one crimes reported for the entire year for 2014. Now this is what you're interested in. This is Southern Division. This is Allen and Allen. So for the months of uh, November, December, and January, where we saw a spike in crime, if you look at for the burglary line, under the burglary part one crime, you had 57 in November, 56 in December, and 82 tentatively in January. Now, that's for the property crime, for burglaries. Now, if you go up top and you look uh, on this side, where it says beat out in five, for violent crimes, you had one. Which is really good for the entire three months. So, relatively, for violent crimes uh, in Alameda Valley, you are doing the best in the city. So, violent crime would be a homicide, it would be a robbery, a rape, an aggravated assault, someone shoots a gun at you, or a violent, a domestic violence is also considered a violent crime. May I ask the folks by the door to come in further so the people outside can come inside? Stop rolling. Excuse me, there are about 300 um, people outside, and the microphone helps a lot. It really does, but it, if you hold it consistently by your mouth and if you can turn it up, it would help a lot more. Because we're trying to listen. We really want to be here and be a part of it, too. Thank you for that suggestion, though. Yeah, come in here and sit in the middle aisle. Come on, It's a bunch. You want to go? Okay. Come on, Come on, Come on, Thank you. 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 Uh, were, were occurring. 
Now, I still wanted to know how engaged the community was. Were they calling when we had suspicious activity reporting, or when they saw suspicious a vehicle? So this is what I got. <laughs> Time for the day, it shows that the majority of the burglaries were occurring between 9 and, say, 4 o'clock, where you see the peaks at 10, 11, 12, and 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that important? Because that's when you, we need you to be very vigilant, those that are walking their dogs or are out in the neighborhoods, to understand that the majority of the burglaries don't occur at night. They occur when you're not home. And that's when we need those eyes and ears. You know who should be in your neighborhoods, who looks suspicious. That's when we need you to really call. And that's very important. I'll get to that later on in the slide. This was for last year. Um, but you can see that Friday was the peak day for all of Southern Division. Oh, yeah. Now, this chart here is what we use. It's an analytical um, that gives us time of day and, and day of the week. This is something that the captain or the lieutenants or sergeants can pull up and see exactly what's going on week to week. And this gives days of the week for district out. This is for last year. So the peak for last year was Wednesday. All right, so these are the calls, suspicious calls. You guys are the, the, the division that calls the most when it comes to the... <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm going to go through this. I only have 30 seconds. This is a lyric. We were asking why are burglaries increasing? Why has it become such a trend? So this is a lyric from a uh, rapper, and he basically describes how to do a knock-knock burglary. Okay, and this is what we're seeing as a pattern with many of our burglaries. So he says, first you find a house. Second, you get your crew. Third, you pull up to a spot and you knock and you listen. Now, I do have a video that the audio is not working, but Cheryl Hurd's did a story as a 13 year old who was at home alone. And you can hear her knock, knock, knock. And the 13 year old explained how they knocked on the door and they didn't know an answer. So, one of the things our crime prevention specialist would tell you is if someone knocks on your door to say something loudly, make yourself known so that they know you're in the house. If you don't, the next thing that they will do is kick in the door. All right, so I'm just going to go right to the good work that the officers are doing. Now, these are officers um, that were working in the Hoffman Viamonte. We had a homicide which was gang related in the Hoffman Viamonte area, um, and this was in November. These two officers started to walk that beat. There are sergeants, Sergeant Spears, one of your best sergeants out here in Southern Division. You have a lot of Sergeant Joaquin Loretto. You have some great sergeants out here, but they, they assigned these two officers. Well, there was a robbery that occurred in that area, and the robber was a gang member who threatened the clerk that if he reported it, he was going to come back and stab him. Well, they did some follow-up, and they arrested that armed or that dangerous uh, suspect. That's one. Uh, this officer, Mitten, was in the area of Sylvandale. Like I said, our gangs are a priority in Southern Division. He arrested a member of the uh, Foxdale boys uh, with a loaded 9mm during a uh, traffic stop. Another hot crime or gang area for us in Southern Division is the Round Table Crocker Court area. We had a homicide there back in August. Um, these officers have been working that area and they arrested three suspects, one with a loaded part. So they're doing some extraordinary work. Um, the homicide that happened on Hoffman Diamante, the homicide unit, and the officers working that area were, arrest, were able to arrest these suspects on that case that happened in Hoffman in November. So what have been the, the outcome of our burglary suppression effort? We started, we deployed this program back in uh, May of of 2014. There's been a total of 106 um, arrests that was just updated today. Uh, there were nine crews of three or more people that have been arrested as a result of the patrolmen, the burglary suppression, and the contact and completion uh, officers. There were 19 arrests of two or more, or two suspects. So I did a breakdown or 
uh, R&D unit did a breakdown, and 53% of the suspects arrested were juveniles, 47% uh, were adults. Why and isn't this on the television? I'm sorry. Why isn't this on the television? You hear about nobody out there. Okay, well, that's, that's why you, that's why we're here today. So I well, yeah, but that doesn't get it on television. Well, there are two video clips that didn't play. It is on television, but I didn't play it. Can we ask questions now, or please? Uh, please hold your question until the end. We'll have our free open forum after the Q and A session that we have to be collected from the residents. Thank you. This is a burglary suppression card I was working yesterday. It responded to a suspicious activity uh, uh, call of theft from the front door and we probably all heard about them stealing packages. And they were able to follow up, they arrested two suspects just yesterday. And one of the suspects that they arrested is part of a, a big crew that we've been uh, uh, investigating. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this uh, also occurred. Four officers and one sergeant conducted burglary suppression. This happened on the 9th. Uh, they arrested three suspects for felony warrants. And this this is ongoing. All right, so I'm just going to go through these highlights. And this is one of the cases that happened in Adam 5 on Mojave. Those three individuals are were arrested. Um, and those three individuals are Norteño gang members or affiliated with a Norteño gang. And let me tell you what happened. So they committed this burglary. We had a good witness who got the license. I don't know if that person's here today, but that helped us solve this case. Um, the suspects left the area, they got spray cans out, and they started spray painting XIV, which is a gang symbol, in red paint. Uh, one of our city workers saw that, they called us, we responded, and we stopped those individuals. During the course of the investigation, we learned that that plate was associated to a burglary in District Adam. During that of course, someone was on probation. We searched the car. We found the uh, loaded firearm. Those suspects were arrested after we called the victims to do an infill. We called an infill to identification. That witness or victim recognized uh, these suspects, and they were arrested. Now, Officer Ryan Chan, that CTC means contact and completion. Officer Ryan Chan, uh, while investigating on patrol, lifted some really good fingerprints, which linked back to our suspect, Jacob Breston. Uh, and this is all part of our contact to completion where the patrolmen continue to follow up even after the, uh, the case is completed. Now, Lieutenant Paul Messier from our burglary unit, who's sitting up here, assigns cases, the cases that are viable that we can follow up on, to patrol officers. Uh, through Lieutenant Mike King. That's the coordination between the Bureau of Investigations and Patrol, so that we can still follow up on those cases, although we only have the one burglary detective that's uh, in the burglary unit. Illegal street racing. So we not only do the burglars, we do the gangs, and we also do the illegal street racing. So Lieutenant Monahan um, has designed a comprehensive program to do uh, street racing enforcement. And it's been very successful. Sergeant Carr is, has been part of that. I had two officers that I don't want to show here, um, and there's a video that goes along with this where we are capturing the illegal street racing as it's happening. We not only capture that information, but we do the follow-up, and we, are, we go and we may confiscate the car, and we get warrants, and we're in the process of getting some warrants now for people that are engaged in that, that type of activity. And this is a dragnet warning. This is what they put out on social media. They're saying that the San Jose area is heating up with police enforcement so that maybe they should cool off for a while and not come to San Jose. That's what we do. <laughs> and I'm done. We'll take questions. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for those who submitted questions to me. Um, so what I did was I compiled all the questions in different categories and directed at specific <coughs> presenters up here. So before we start the Q&A, I'd like you to uh, uh, pay attention to this lady right here, Julie. She has in her hands a petition uh, signage. I don't know if you know about it, but there's a petition circulating regards to relocation of the uh, community policing center from the Oak Ridge Center to 
um, center of Almaty to increase visibility of the officers in our area. So as you all know, we don't have any policing department here, so we figured, why not bring down the community policing center that's an office area that's not being fully utilized down to center of Almaty. And I'm hoping to... have them signed online or on the paper, uh, you have the opportunity to sign the document today. And in a couple of weeks, I am going to the city council meeting to present it, and I'm hoping that the mayor would approve it, um, to bring down the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, we'll have the, the petition circulating. Um, Julie? Can you give the online? Uh, online, I could give that to you. At the end of the session, would that be okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. So we're going to begin with our first Q and A. Uh, first question. We're going to go through all the questions with Captain and the, the assistant uh, chief. Sorry about that. Um, first, and then we'll go to the mayor's question and the councilman. So the first question is: We understand that the officers from the metro unit and other specialty units have been assigned to investigate crimes in all within area as well as having mandatory overtime for police officers. Should the allocation be to the response of the crimes in progress rather than the investigation after the crimes have occurred? It would appear that if more officers were responding to the problems, there would be less to investigate after the fact, thus a better utilization of resources. This seems to be short-term fix for current shortage of officers in San Jose. What is the long-term solution to increase SJPD patrols in Alameda Valley? <laughs> that's that's a really easy question. No, well, first of all, let me clear up something. Okay, we did uh, uh, reassign units from the metro unit. Uh, quite frankly, right now, the 23 officers in metro and the sergeants that were assigned are now in the basic patrol structure, and they'll be there until shift changes in the middle, in the middle of March. And it's not specifically for Almaden; it's for the entire city. Um, I know we're here to specifically talk about the problems, but I cannot, uh, I can't honestly tell you that we're here, that the issues that we have that we completely bring our resources down to this area. We have a city of a million people that we have to provide public safety for, and so those officers are throughout the the entire city. And again, their main job is to answer the 911 call for service. Now, I will say that is that is that is a short term. We we can't sustain uh, working on overtime. And we can't not have special operations units that can respond to specific issues that happen in the city. So our long-term goals, and quite frankly, that may be also a question later on, I think that can be addressed, is really, again, getting uh, our uh, POA and our city leaders together in a room and to get them to hash out and discuss the issues that plague the department right now, which is our retention and our recruitment. And we need to solve that. Uh, first, as a as part of the long term, as part of the long term goals. Thank you. The second question will be read by Patrick. So I think one question got answered, but can, can somebody talk about the police academies? If I hire somebody in the private sector and I put a retention bonus or retention stipulation and train that person, uh, academies. What is in, there's a lot of power here, a lot of clout. What is in the administration or police administration's authority to make sure a candidate stays throughout the process, stays for six months, 12 months, or repays the student? Yeah. It's certainly a reasonable question to ask. I think uh, we all know in the private sector, the military, and other context, there can be callback provisions, for example, that require you to pay back the cost of training, things like that. It's actually something both Councilman Camus and I had proposed what, about a year and a half ago. Uh, the fundamental challenge is we've got a state law, uh, it's called the myers Millis brown Act, it requires any time you want to address issues of compensation, that term is read pretty broadly, any time you're addressing what's happening with someone's wallet, and they're a public employee, you have to negotiate over it. Uh, and uh, I would love to be able to negotiate a means for us to be able to uh, encourage more folks to come. We are ready to get pay increases. Uh, we're also 
I would love to be able to have a clawback provision as well. Uh, right now we have a closed contract with the police union, and we are eagerly trying to get them to the table so we can talk about resolving all the pension and other issues that are uh, very much an issue right now. Uh, but until we start that negotiation, there's not much that can happen. Uh, you know, I'll be blunt, I don't think it's likely we're going to be able to get a clawback provision in right away because we've got a, a lot of very uh, weighty issues right now that um, the, I can tell you that right now the fundamental issue is officers are leaving because they don't believe they're being well compensated because someone else can compensate them better. And so we've got to address that first before we can even get to a problem. So close the academy and recruit from elsewhere. Use the money that way. Yeah. If they're not going to stay, then fine. Close the academy and recruit sure. elsewhere. Yeah, and they probably speak this better than I can, but I can tell you the competition for police officers right now is uh, for recruiting is, is very heated, as you know. Uh, it's a high economy. And I can tell you Bay Area wide, regardless of what they're paying in any department, every department is working very hard to try to hire officers. And even the ones that are paying better than us are not necessarily always filling their academies, right? Uh, so right now, there's a lot of competition for good candidates. We have often 1,000 people apply, but they're not of the caliber that we need for this department. We have very high standards, and we want to keep those standards. If I could just uh, add an excellent question, and I understand that, and there's a frustration all over the place, but I will say this. I remember a period of time back in, I was hired in 1992. Uh, over 4,000 people had applied for a job that they only hired 45 of us. They were doing a higher head program at the time, and I had started an academy with 55 people. There was, and I'm going to get philosophical here for a second, there was a time that people were scratched and clawed to wear this patch. Mm -hmm. And we need to get back to that. We need to get back to the time. <laughs> Working on the major issue is what's important because I don't want, quite frankly, I don't want to force an officer. We we are sitting here less than two miles away from a place where an officer gave his life for this community. And mm -hmm. he did that because he loved this community and this is where he wanted to be. So we need to work on the bigger issue to keep to, to, to bring back the pride and make sure people want to be here and not force them. Hi, my name is Richard Collins. Some of this has possibly been asked already, but we're informed that there were over 3,000 applicants at the last police academy. Only 20 or 30 were accepted. The city has struggled to hire police officers and personnel, while many existing officers are leaving for various reasons. What plans specifically? Perhaps in the salary and compensation you have to keep officers we have at the PD already and also to attract another level of potential recruits. Uh, so compensation is certainly at the heart of it, as is disability. I think many of you uh, are aware of the, the issues that have been played out in the media, and many of those issues are quite real. Uh, compensation. Uh, we knew that all of our employees took a big sacrifice, a big hit through uh, the recession. Uh, in the case of the police officers, uh, they voluntarily took what was equivalent to about a 13 to 40 percent pay cut in addition to uh, the changes that happened through, through Measure B and pension reform. And so we pushed over the last two and a half years to restore the pay. I believe pay will be fully restored by the end of this year under the current contract. Uh, we obviously have an issue around pensions, we have an issue around disability. And we've got to resolve those issues at the bargaining table, that's the only way to do it. And we have clearly expressed as a council a desire uh, to renegotiate the issue of disability. I think there's a real opportunity to come to common ground there. Uh, and we can do it without significantly impacting our taxpayers. Uh, on the issue of pensions, it's definitely more complex. But again, I think this council has expressed a desire to renegotiate, to find a path for, for lack of a better term, a kinder, of gentler pension reform. Uh, we know we need the savings. We know that what was created wasn't sustainable. And we have a $3 billion unfunded debt to prove it. So we've got to find a way creatively to grapple with that debt 
At the same time, we're keeping people on board. And there's only one path through this, and that is negotiation. We're ready to negotiate, and I hope the POA will be too. I, I want to also note that um, I've only been in office for two years, but in both of those years, we were ba basically scraping by. Our budget was was enough to pay for what we um, have, ser the services that we have. Same amount of library hours, which are only four days a week. Same amount of parks being open. We're still at that level where we're net not able to advance the services. So just to let you know, we're coming out of a huge recession where, where our city had to lay off thousands of people and reduce services dramatically. We're just coming out of that right now. The economy's starting to improve. I'm, not, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that the economy will continue to improve, that we can provide more services. We're working very hard to bring companies here, the big, the big taxpayers um, here, and uh, to provide more. And uh, so, so it's, it's kind of um, difficult to provide more uh, when we don't have more. And so I just want to be clear. We want to work as uh, responsible citizens to make sure that our employees are paid as much as we could possibly afford. And that's where we're at. Uh, my name is Leon Gervin. Uh, this is uh, Director to the Captain this is in Chief. <coughs> Many of us have experienced slow police response times for the burglar cases. Many feel that the presence and response time for San Jose Police is inadequate to deter and catch criminals. What actions will you take now and continue to take to increase police presence and improve response rates in Alameda and Bell? I'm the messenger. <coughs> My real question is, of those 103 people that have been arrested, how many of them are back on the street? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let uh, Captain Williams cover those hard parts. <laughs> I'll let Captain Williams cover uh, the, what we're trying to do to increase visibility in the area. But what I will tell you, back, back up, I mean, I can't tell you, that's a... Uh, how many are in custody? But what we do know is this. If you have 100 burglaries, they're not committed by 100, in our experience, they're not committed by 100 different people. Okay? So for every burglar that you catch, odds are not only did you solve a case that you may not have known about, but you're definitely solving future ones. And so that's, that's important to remember, remember as we go through that, that arrest. As far as with the response times, we do the big things well. Okay, and as I had mentioned prior, we respond and we take care of the crimes against the person in that 911 call for service first. And our response times for those priority, what are considered priority one calls, are at about six minutes. Okay, which is very good for those priority one calls. Now that comes at a considerable cost. Because as we're concentrating on those priority one calls, they're priority two calls, when you get home and you find that your house has been burglarized, that becomes a priority two call. Now, I'm not talking about a burglary in progress. That's a priority one call. I'm talking about when you get home and you've been victimized. Those calls are taking us about 20 minutes to get to, which is a number that we want to improve. However, because our main responsibility is to answer the 911 call for service when someone is in danger, that is what that that is what has to get. Now, specifically, the actions we're taking to Increase some, some visibility out here. I'll let Captain Gerber. I'll, I'll have to call you Captain so next week. <laughs> Captain Williams, yes. In terms of visibility, um, we want, first of all, our patrol officers when they're available to circulate the neighborhoods. We're also, with the burglary suppression cars, I get two compliments uh, a week. That's eight cars a month. Now, what I did when I first took over, I had gang cars. I had 10 gang cars. So. I analyzed the data and I saw that many of the burglaries were committed by gang members. So I took those cars and I dedicated half the cars to do burglary suppression. Now, we're going to have uh, more visibility with the truancy abatement officers. Those are overtime officers that come in on their time off to work those assignments. In addition to that, we have our CSOs that will take the reports for the burglaries. Now, in terms of how many are back out on the street, I looked at that this week because I wanted to know if the kids that actually did some uh, burglaries here in Allen Valley and they, they killed the poor dog, 
um, were still in custody or they were outside of custody. So that's why Johnny Gogo is here. <laughs> I had an interesting conversation with the um, juvenile DA about what happens with the minors when they commit burglaries. So if Johnny would like to speak to that, he can, or I can also speak. That was a great question, sir. Um, and it's complicated because it depends uh, partly on the uh, success of the investigation in terms of whether or not we're able to catch them in the act or match up fingerprints or match up DNA. It depends on how old the juvenile is. It depends on if he's got a prior record. I will tell you that with respect to juveniles, the Welfare, Welfare and Institutions Code, which basically governs how we deal with juveniles, the, the stated goal of that is rehabilitation. And so unfortunately, the juveniles don't serve as much time as the adults do. So for the, I don't know the exact numbers of the 103, well, I, I think the percentage was about 53% were juveniles. Those juveniles were probably, the majority of them are probably out of custody, to be honest with you. I did run some of the numbers on the adults, and those range from some folks received nine years in prison because of prior criminal activity. I saw another young man who received two years in prison. Unfortunately, I did see another person who received, actually this was for a commercial burglary, different from a residential burglary. Uh, the person who received, uh, who, who was convicted of the commercial burglary, uh, 90 days, three years formal probation, so other factors to take into account are, uh, you know, the, the changes in the law uh, that, uh, you know, that, that the voters have passed throughout the state. Uh, you heard about some of the prisoners that are coming back out of prison. They're, getting, they're coming back to our communities. Uh, another factor is people who, again, committed crimes and uh, were convicted and, and maybe sentenced to four or five years many years ago are coming back down as well. And so it's a revolving door, unfortunately. May I ask a question? Can we hold it till the end when we have a brief long? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
that would be a form of verification. All right. Could you repeat the question so I can hear what the question is? I can't even remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody sees them on camera, it's a verification. Yes. What about in or Yes. So the question is, the current beat lines for district I haven't changed over seven years. And the current beat lines were created when crimes were low and the population was less dense in Almaden. Uh, so that's no longer the case now. Does the police department have any plans to reassess the beat lines as the current distribution does not seem to reflect the needs of San Jose, specifically Mr. K? Uh, and that's it. Good question. Uh, the timing of these questions is great. From earlier this week, we spoke to uh, some vendors and started starting to explore the ways that we can do this with the city. Uh, the reality of it is, uh, there's, there's two realities. One, is that you know when the city changes, we're, we're, we're still deploying our patrol forces in the same manner we did 15 years ago when we had less people and more police officers. So that just fundamentally does not seem bad. So we need to look at that. However, the other reality of it is, it doesn't matter how we draw lines right now. We don't have a staff in this building. So a lot of these plans are fantastic, and we will and we need to get there. But we need that fun, we need that fundamental block of our increased staffing levels to be able to experience all these things. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm Marie Franco, 27-year resident of Almaden. We've uh, really touched on this in a number of different better yeah. Yeah. touched on this question in a number of different ways. PowerPoint presentations went through all of that really quickly, a lot of numbers, so if you could summarize once again, please, as it relates specifically to Almaden. Has the recent increase in police president, presence in Almaden reduced the number of burglary instances? And if so, what is being done to keep the current police staffing in Almaden? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so, when we began to burglary suppression in certain areas, we see we did see a reduction. Almaden Valley wasn't the spike that I saw when we first started. So, in the Cambrian area, there was a big spike in burglaries. We had the complement. So, we'll look at the hot zones and see where do we have an increase, and that's where we'll send our complements because we only have. Certain number. In those areas, over time, we do see a reduction. And over the last 10 days, I've seen a marked reduction in this area. So that answers the question. I hope it continues for the remainder of this month. But yes, I have seen some of the reduction. So we're tacking in this question because now I'll cover the staffing portion of it. I always get the unpopular answers. But again, the sustainability of being able to provide the specific service that we're providing when we have to take, in, take into account the entire rest of the city who also has their issues. So what we have to do is we have to come in, we try to hit it hard, okay, but we can't sustain the overtime, we can't, we can't ignore other parts of the city, so we have to come in, do what we can, hope for some reductions, strengthen the community, Okay, whether it be through uh, Race of Angels efforts, through the communication you have amongst yourselves, through nextdoor.com, and all that, and all those things, and strengthen your, your relations with the division captain, and, and that's, how we have, that's how we have to attack problems in the city right now. We have to take them once at a time. We can't leave a force here when there's other issues that we have to deal with the city. Thank you. So we will now open the question to the floor, but please make sure to keep your questions brief and make sure it applies to everyone, to the community, not to just yourself. Thank you. Uh, do we have runners in the back? Yeah, I'll be the one. I, I like to ask the district attorney for a question. Now, I, I heard online uh, there were a couple of seventy-six years old were tied up by a robber. Yes. Yeah. Now, now, my question here is, suppose this house is armed, 
with shotgun. And the guy's come in breaking the door. And he shoots that guy in that house. And he accidentally kills him. So I just heard the members of the uh, audience, uh, the gentleman's question was, um, he started off by saying there was a case where there was an elderly person, about 76, year old, 76 years old, was a victim of a home invasion, was tied up. Uh, the gist of this question was, though, uh, do you have the right to self-defense in your home, essentially? Yes. I'm not here to give you legal advice, sir, but if you kill a burglar inside your home, I do not think that you're going to get charged with the crime. Responsibilities uh, for those youth who are arrested. In this case, we see the majority of the arrests involve uh, juveniles. What are their responsibilities for those uh, individuals? So let me first just pull the classic politician punt and tell you uh, we don't run the school system. The 19 school districts have their own school boards and superintendents. So we don't have, uh, frankly, responsibility or the ability to tell folks what to do in the school districts. What we do have in the city is called, is called the Mayor's Gain Prevention Task Force. Uh, and we work with our superintendents in the schools, we work with uh, community-based organizations, nonprofits, who are working hard every single day. This morning I was in a meeting uh, with about 80 of them, working on how we deal with youth offenders, how we deal with at-risk youth, making sure if they committed once, then we're getting them into programs after they're, they've served whatever uh, time through their rehabilitation. Uh, because we don't control the juvenile system, and we don't control state law. All we can do is make sure that we try to get to those kids before the games do. And you know, it's often been said, you can't arrest your way out of a game problem. And one reason for that is because, as we know, if you arrest a juvenile, they will be back out. That's part of the, the, the system, and within the system which we operate, the best we can do is making sure if we have an opportunity to get an analyst to do the job, we get them a job. Uh, if we need to get them in a program, we get them in a program. If we need to get them in, in after school tutoring, whatever it is, we've got to do whatever we can to give that young, almost always a man, uh, an option. <clears throat> Uh, so that's how I see my role as mayor. That's why we launched these working groups this week to focus on after school programs and at risk job, jobs are at risk needs. Thank you. I think you guys have done a great job of talking about some really great long term um, you know, just programs and ways to prevent crime, the video next door, etc. What are some tactical things we can do today to protect ourselves? What are you? What are some commonalities that you are seeing in these 109 burglaries? What kind of cars are they driving? I don't want to, you know, throw out the word racial profiling, but there's obviously some, you know, commonalities there. But what can we look for specifically to identify potential criminals? And what do we should we go out and be buying guns? Yes. What fences? What what are things that are proven? Like if a guy gets shot here in one of our houses, will that prevent the next you know gang from coming in here? What are what are some things that are proven in other communities that you know are test cases that have you know tactics that have worked that have truly worked? We certainly don't. We certainly don't want you to be a vigilante. So. What we do recommend is having the neighborhood watch meetings where we show you how to set up layers and make your home a hard target with the alarm, with the signage, with video cameras. You know, if you have a dog, all those things, we'll show you how to reinforce doors. All those things to prevent the burglar, first of all, coming in your home. 
what I really want are your eyes and ears. Many of those arrests that we've made is because good neighbors, which is your best alarm system, is watching out for their neighbors and they call when they see something suspicious. Most people should be at work during those times. If you're walking around and uh, you see cars driving up and down or people looking at your case in your house, that's when you need to call. If you get the license plate number, if you get a description, if you just call us, we've responded. I didn't play some of the videos, but many of the videos where we have caught those crews was because good neighbors were watching out uh, for each other. And that's the best that, that we can hope for uh, if you do that. Now, Grace and Daniel can set up the neighborhood watch meetings for you, and that will give you enough information to make your homes a hard target. Um, but the bottom line is we do need boots on the ground. We do need more officers in those neighborhoods, and that's what we try to do with our burglary suppression cars and our gang suppression cars and a lot of the overtime officers that are out there. Can I just add, please do sign up for our registry. Uh, we want this to work, and that means we need everybody to sign up. That'll help everybody else be safe. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Sandy. I've been a resident of Allen and Valley for 35 years, and I remember that uh, reading somewhere a long time ago that uh, San Jose Police Department was one of the best in the nation. And I want to thank you for all, your, uh, all of your service. Um, one of the best, except that it's extremely understaffed, and I understand that from the 56 people that graduated from the academy, maybe nine just stayed in the, in the area. And maybe the problem has to be with the incentives that tier two police officers get, which are the new officers. Um, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, they're only getting 65% uh, of their pension compared to CalPERS and other areas that get 80 as well as they pay 20% towards their benefits compared to other um, departments who pay 9%. So what kind of negotiation is being done with the Tier 2? I know you're negotiating with POA, but they're also Tier 1 officers. So what is being done to give incentive to these new officers to sign up and stay in the area? Great question. I want to correct one thing. We're actually not negotiating. That's the problem. Right? We can't accomplish anything until we're negotiating. So we reached out two weeks ago. We were eager to negotiate. I'm hopeful we're going to negotiate very soon. Uh, but I think it's important for all of us to be mindful that two things can be equally true. One is that we know officers have left and are leaving because of compensation issues, which also make it difficult for us to attract officers. It's also true, by the way, and don't believe me because I'm a politician. So by all means, look it up for yourself. Uh, we lost 320 officers in total police staffing. 320 officers net. That is, we lost more officers than we gained between the Great Recession and the passage of pension reform. Okay, and the reason why we lost 320 officers was because we were broke, right? We laid off 66 officers in 2010 alone. We have a lot of officers retiring because they can retire at age 51, 52, and we have no money to hire any officers back. We had a freeze on hiring. So there are two challenges we face, right? One is we know we need to create a compensation structure that works better than it does now. At the same time, we need to make sure we have the money to actually hire an officer. And we have to solve both of those problems. And so the only way we'll do it is through negotiation, and I hope we'll do it right away. We have, a, we have a question. What's the question? Hi. Next question. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Nick Lovosky. I'm a 20 year resident of Almaden Valley, 30 year resident of the city of San Jose. And I have a solution for us. It has a lot to do with the tactical question that the uh, gentleman had a moment ago. We crowdsourced uh, use of surveillance cameras and also uh, interaction between community members in our neighborhood. So this has driven the crime rate, the burglary rate, to zero in the Almaden Winery neighborhood. All around us, we're being hit like crazy, but not in our neighborhood. This solution is also being used in our nation's capital by uh, the uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Metro Police, and it's called Capital Shield. 
what they do is they go <coughs> take it even a step further. So I applaud the uh, Mayor Carl, the uh, registration of cameras, but this is a step further than that. It's a use of an application where you citizens can communicate with each other in real time. You can view your, your cameras in your neighborhood in real time through cooperative, like-minded neighbors. And they take it a step further and use a public and private partnership between uh, businesses that already have install installed cameras on their businesses that are already capturing this kind of data. Maybe they got to point the data that the camera closer to get license plates. And uh, there's an identified company that I've identified that participates in Capitol Shield in Washington, D.C. that will actually give the city of San Jose hundreds of cameras in order to put those out and help uh, a big crime. This is a solution that's worked already here in Amadou Valley. It's already worked in our nation's capital. And I'd like to suggest that we try something much like this beyond camera registration, which is a great idea. Good first step. Do this it. will take it first. Do it. Do it. Um, Susie, let me get this question over here. Susie, uh, two questions over here. Thank you. Um, I want to thank both the politicians and the police for coming out. Uh, and this is a question to the police, and this is something I would like everybody in this room to be aware of, when we should be calling 911 and how to keep our children safe. I'm going to make this really brief, but a crime that nobody's talking about, there's a lot of hit and runs going on, where children on bicycles are being hit by cars, and the drivers are leaving the scene, and they're not giving the information to these kids. And it just happened last week in Almaden, and my friend is foreign. She didn't know. She should dial 911 right away. If you don't dial it, her kid was thrown on top of a truck. There were injuries. And a neighbor walked her home. The guy um, was a day worker at a construction site. So I just want everybody to know to tell your children if you're on a bicycle, call 911 if you're hit by a car, because that driver may leave. And if he doesn't give his in any drivers out there, you have to stop. You need to give the child your driver's license, your insurance information, because otherwise it is a hit and run. I just want to draw attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I have you. a quick question. <clears throat> Earlier you said that 53% of yeah, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just respond briefly to this? This is a very serious concern. I just want to let you know, uh, I hear you loud and clear. We've got a serious pedestrian safety problem in this city. Uh, by the way, we're seeing that spike in lots of cities throughout the state. A lot of distracted driving, a lot of problems. Uh, we, we are going to see, I hope, a budget in the next three months that's going to allocate more funding for some basic things like radar trailer uh, uh, readouts that do help control and reduce speeds. And I think you're going to see, I hope with the support of my colleagues, some funding for additional traffic calming devices. We know we'd love to have more police officers, but in the absence of more officers, we need to do more to the gate. So more, more to come. Earlier you had said that 53% of robberies were occurring from juveniles. I would like to know, are those juveniles from San Jose or from the Central Valley? I heard secondhand that, that a lot of games were coming from elsewhere and coming to the richer neighborhoods in the Silicon Valley to uh, perform crimes. I prefer the police answer if they have the data. <laughs> So, I didn't say robberies, burglaries, and that was only for the arrests that we made in the Southern Division. And I actually did look at where are these uh, minors coming from, what areas of the city, or, or, or are they from outside the city? The majority are from San Jose. Um, are they from this area? No. Um, there were the two minors that were, uh, that did the burglary and that killed the animal. They were from this area. But the uh, majority are not. Two short questions. My name is Elaine. I live in the Marin area. Uh, it's not a rich area by any means, but, and we don't have burglar alarms on most of our houses. Um, we lost over $50,000 worth of heirloom jewelry from our grandparents, as well as a computer on by a big table over there. And I'm wondering what's happening to shut down fencing operations for goods that are stolen because these people aren't just wearing my gun and bang, are they? And then my other question is, uh, you were talking about having fingerprints, but we had great fingerprints on our window. They were never taken. I called the police to ask if they would come out. No one ever got back to me. So I'd like to know why there was no fingerprints taken and where the stuff is gone. My name is Paul Nestier. 
CA on the uh, Burberry Commander. Uh, a lot of the items that are being taken uh, are being immediately sold. Um, I'm sure you've all been to malls where you see the cash for gold kiosks. The, the burglars are not holding on to these items. They're, they're, they're targeting small valuable items that they can sell quickly, move fast, and they want the cash. So unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to recover these items. Now, we do receive pawn slips from pawn shops, but unfortunately, we do not have the staff to look at every pawn slip that comes in. We collect them, we file them, we organize them in anticipation of getting staff. But unfortunately, we do not have staff right now to analyze every pawn slip that comes in. What about the fingerprint? Next, next question over here. Just address the fingerprint issue, because I think that was the yeah. important one. Right, you want to take one in? I was going to address the fingerprint. I was just curious, when, when did this occur? Uh, two days after Thanksgiving. Two days after Thanksgiving. Great time. No, it was a terrible time. Okay. You know, I, without looking at a specific case to see exactly you know, why they didn't take it, we have to look back at that. And one of the things that we're doing with the addition of more community service officers, they, that's why, that's one of the main reasons we, we got for them to be able to respond out after this capital crime, take some fingerprints so that would enable the officers that are on duty to be able to go out and catch a bad guy. So uh, I apologize in your situation, we're hoping that we get more CSOs on board that those type of frustrations are going to be less than us. That hiring is happening and they are staying. <laughs> Thank you for calling this meeting. I think you can see by the volume of people who are still here that when you have a problem with something that there aren't enough room big enough, right, that you can take this problem seriously. My question is about ongoing communication. Um, given that you tried really hard to communicate a lot of data, the data didn't necessarily maybe translate in a way that was really easily and quickly helpful. How are you going to communicate on an ongoing basis? How are you going to leverage technology to broadcast these statistics in a way that's truly meaningful to the community instead of using internal technology that's not helpful for us? So that we can hold you, frankly, accountable. Right? We want to see literal lines going down like this. We want to see arrests and you know, jail time going up. How can you work together to make that information visible on an ongoing basis? Excellent, excellent question. Did a lot of excellent questions. And you know, we all also, also ourselves have kind of this problem. And one of the things that we have to do is, you know, this goes, you know, we've been talking about relations throughout, in light of everything that's happened in Ferguson and nationwide about police relations with the community. And it's not solely the, the race relations that we have to have that we, that we have with our community to better go, but it's also those these relationships. We should not, quite frankly, wait to have this type of frustration to me. Uh, this, this, this shouldn't be the forum. We should be meeting on a regular basis with, and we're going to introduce your new captain here in a minute, but absolutely, we need, to, we need to continue to have either whether it's smaller meetings so that it never gets to this, to the, to this, to this point. Use technology. This is the technology capital of the world. Uh, you're absolutely the strength to get that data out on a broadcast instead of, for every person that's here, there's 10 people that couldn't come yep. that wanted to be here. So, you know, leverage that. Regarding our house. So just to let you know, I, I think that's a great question. <laughs> Those of you who actually receive my newsletter, um, receive updates on crime uh, once a month. Because once a month we talk about something other than crime, and once a month we talk about crime in every one of, uh, in every other one of our newsletters. We also have a website that you can log on to. I also on my Facebook, I actually announced the successes quite publicly, thanking our police officers, because they've had many successes, quite frankly, in our neighborhoods. So if you want to stay in touch, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to set up those community uh, meetings, the neighborhood watch groups are the, the, the most intimate and best way to get to know your neighbors. We will be glad to help you set up uh, one of those. Furthermore, um, if you are having trouble, like let's say you have camera evidence. In the past, um, when, when we didn't even have CSO officers, uh, citizens actually sent me some camera footage and I made sure that our police officers were, uh, Captain Honda at the time, chased down the criminals, Capo criminals, that actually was in the Amundan Winery neighborhood. Um, so if you are having trouble uh, getting service, please contact my office. My staff is here to help everybody. And so um, 
I am accountable. I want you to inform me what's going on, and I, and I will do my best to inform you. You know, even if you don't want to read every newsletter, subscribe to it. You can just delete it, put it in the trash, <laughs> but, uh, but please do sign up. There's technology available now. Please go on sjpd.org, and you will see an interactive map that enables you to identify the crimes in your neighborhood. Uh, we're also working with our uh, IT team at City Hall. Uh, you probably heard of programs like C Click Fix. Uh, we want to see if we can integrate these crime maps with other kinds of uh, maps that, that indicate uh, problems in your neighborhood, street lights that are out, potholes, whatever it might be. Some of these can actually, in fact, improve safety, obviously, when we resolve them more quickly, and enable neighbors to communicate with one another about how to solve problems in their neighborhood. We're going to be pushing on that in the coming year. Mayor Ricardo, um, I see that uh, I see that the problem with public safety and police is budget driven. And as a 23-year resident, I see a systemic, ongoing misallocation of funds. We overbuild on buildings. We built <laughs> city hall. We built leaving new libraries and then curtailed the hours, even shut them down a couple of days a week. We got a, a brand new police house station that stayed closed for five years and now is doing support. It's not really a precinct. And we we're replacing fire stations, that's an old fire stations. Can we please permanently cut in half our budget allocation, whatever, wherever the, however you describe the money, whatever, whatever charter protects it, can we cut it in half, please, and give the money back to operations? Yeah. 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 What you're describing is a phenomenon that's a hangover of the boom we had two recessions ago. In 2000 and 2002, the voters approved bond measures that were enthusiastically advocated by, by City Hall to build libraries and substations and fire stations and lots of other things. All that capital money came out of those bond measures. Those bond measures can't pay for a single police officer. Under the law, the capital restricted. So what you had is a phenomenon for the next dozen years after these bond measures passed was we we're building buildings. Two recessions later, we've got no money to fill the buildings with people. And I think we all recognize services are delivered by people, not by buildings. So I can assure you, we're not in the building business. <laughs> we are not going to be uh, getting out there trying to put out bond measures to create more structures that we can't fill with people under my administration. We'll make sure we have the funding to fill the buildings of people that will serve you. Question about questions. I, I, I think I'm up. I'm guarantee everybody this will be the shortest question. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you said uh, earlier uh, in your announcement that citywide camera registry starting today. Correct. Yes, you mentioned something. You mentioned something about uh, this would also include uh, right. Uh, Car license reader, something like that? No. 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 Car license reader is a, is a device that police officers use. Right. This is simply a tool. This is a much simpler tool, uh, much more basic. Because uh, we're broke, we have to go for basic. So here, here it is. It's just a website. Because the councilman said the same thing here at the first meeting of the year. No, what I said is. We can't can use uh, card readers. Or yeah. Right. What I said was video cameras can help pick up license plates right, if they're properly placed. And so, again, as the community gets together, as individual business owners, property owners, uh, homeowners, uh, identify the spots where they want to put cameras, it's not a bad idea. Uh, if you have an issue, I know this happened in the Alameda and Myron neighborhood where they focus on license plates. That way, when a burglary happens, someone's got immediate access to see who's been driving by. Uh, so th th just to make sure everyone's clear on the system, it's a registry, it's a voluntary registry. If you have a camera, in your home, in your business, you sign up online, your information then goes to the police department, the department keeps it, so when there's a crime nearby, they know who to call to ask for permission. You can always decline uh, the permission, that is, it's always your right, and nobody is snooping in the camera in real time to spy on your neighborhood. This is the same way officers today ask for videotape is the way they will have, it'll happen in the future. I have a question. Mayor. I'm in the middle. 
How you doing? <laughs> All right, I'm Jeremy Warner, also a resident. So I read the report by the chief of police that was submitted to the council in November. And uh, clearly, I, I believe what the officers are saying, that we have a manpower issue. But there are 99 open positions, not including approximately 50 that are set to be filled with uh, academy graduates. So when I, the uh, chief also said that the current uh, rate of officers leaving the department was three to four per month, which is about 4% annually of the force. That is actually lower than typical uh, retention loss in the public sector. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what is being done to recruit to fill the 99 positions? Because I went online, I looked at a number of websites where, uh, or job recruiting websites for officers. My time's up, but I'm gonna finish anyway. Uh, that are job recruiting websites for officers. None of the San Jose Police Department jobs are posted there. Palo Alto is, Santa Clara is, Los Angeles. Who is responsible for recruiting experienced officers to SJPD, and what are they doing? Yeah. 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 Very good question. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the experienced officers part of the crew is very different than what you said. But we have a unit that's dedicated to recruitment of our officers. And I don't know the specific website, but if after me you come and tell me the website that you looked at, then we'll make sure by the end of the week that sounds like is on there. But our officers respond to countless numbers of job fairs, uh, trying to uh, go to diverse uh, areas to build a department in a matter which it reflects the community and so they're out there now granted like the mayor had been mentioned earlier there's a lot of other departments that are searching in the same pool so it, that we are they, they are working extremely hard we have some of the high one of the things that maybe many people understand is we have probably some of the higher stand highest standards to become a San Jose police officer anywhere in the state I challenge you to find many places that do have as high standards as we do. And I'll start with the college requirement. You'd be surprised how many departments do not have the college requirement that the San Jose PD has. That lowers our standards. That, that we will not lower that standard. What officers and recruits have to test in their testing process is highest amongst Northern California agencies. And so our standards are very high. But we're going out and we're knocking on doors and going to job fairs and doing everything we can to attract officers. Now, experienced officers, if you were referring to laterals, that's a complete other other issue that there's fundamental issues created by the current state that we're in that doesn't allow us to attract laterals. So we have to we have to really put all our efforts in attracting entry level police officers, which I can assure you we're doing very hard. But if you show me that, let me know, let me know that website and we'll get on it. You're talking about laterals when you say yeah, experience. I don't understand why we can't recruit officers. Money. Okay. Well, we're concentrating on our efforts. Okay. I totally understand. I'm totally, I totally understand. And we have recruited officers, some from out of state. The one thing you have to understand, and the young lady mentioned it earlier, is under there's, there's quite frankly a different retirement system. Most officers in the state are coming from a first type of retirement and they have to come into a tier two retirement system here that we're hopeful gets negotiated at some point. However, I'm not gonna bore you with all the, the ins and outs of how different first retirement is from tier two, but they would be taking a massive hit by coming to work for the city. And that is an issue that we face in, in attracting laterals. Officer Garcia, I have a question for you. Uh, I have a question for you. As far as the um, So I have a question while she's in the microphone to work. Um, so we've had a couple of times in our neighborhood out by Castellero, um, multiple people knocking on our door about like we're fixing windows in your neighborhood and then later I've heard I've heard those rumors and that those were linked to some of the people who were actually um, part of the burglary. So I just want to see, is that something that was true or is it not true? 
because we're having a lot of people coming door to door now. It seems more often than yeah. I have in the past dealt with it. Yeah. Did you say Castellero? <laughs> well, I I don't have specific information about that area. I would have to be with you, and we'd have to look at that area. We have had um, one case that I'm aware of, yeah, this is in Western, where some people were dressed up like uh, custodians or uh, workers that would fix your your lawns and they had vests on. Well, our officers were able to make an arrest of about four individuals that were knocking on doors, pretending to be the custodians, uh, and they made an arrest in that kind of case. But if you see something suspicious, I think the point is you should call us. If you see something suspicious, like someone's case in the house, you can call them and we'll sort it out. Officer Carson, I'm the latest victim for 2015. I'm the latest victim for 2015, and I would like to let you know that as soon as we enter the house, we and um, we have an alarm system, we have signage on the windows, and uh, we're very careful to turn on the alarm once we do. Um, I called 911, and the response I got was to dial, to get through to this number, you must dial a 1 in your every code. Finally, it went through. I don't know what the hand up was on the phone, but that's that's what I got. And then um, the officer did come out and uh, we put fingerprints and all that. But my question is, really, since the shortage of officers are very, you know, prominent, is there any chance at all to bring in experienced retired officers in the area to do some patrolling? Yes. I'm going to give you an excellent question on that one, not just a good question. <laughs> yes, we have we have a reserve unit that we that we have, uh, but that that reserve unit is mostly comprised of uh, retired retired officers. It is a it is an issue, and it is something that the POA and the administration wants to work on in the future to bring them to bring them here. But that's really the extent of, of, of what we're trying, of, of what we've accomplished. There is a proposal that we're hoping to get some traction on with, with, with POA soon, once we can figure some things out, that we call the PSRP program, and that's a patrol staff and retention plan. And again, not to, to go, there's a lot of little issues to it, but what it does is it, may, it, it allows or it makes it uh, attractive for, for people that are about to retire to stay on for a couple more years so that we can at least stop that gap. And so that's something that, you know, we, we, have, not, we have not sat down to discuss that, but that's something in the future that we have as a long-term plan. Because, I mean, even, even when we have a stop gap, even, even if today we said, we said okay, uh, the measure B issues are, are fixed and we're able to attract officers. We still have, within the next three years, over 170 officers that are going to be retirement eligible within the next three years. So we're going to need some plans to be able to keep, to try to at least make some attractive for those officers to stay. So, but that that is a that is a plan that that, that we're hoping Thank to have some negotiations. And, and just to be clear, the council has fully endorsed that plan that, that Chief Garcia referred to. Uh, and I think there's strong support on the council for the full use of uh, reserve officers, retired officers, to whatever extent we can. I think, uh, as uh, Chief Garcia indicated, there are issues with the union. We're working them out. Question right here question? with the mic, please. Second. I have a question. I'm here representing my parents, 
who have been residents of Almaden for 43 years. Mayor Ricardo has alluded several times this evening to the negotiations. And what I have not heard is that the negotiations are not happening now. Why not? We have, uh, as you might have guessed, it takes two to negotiate. Uh, we are hopeful that the police union will sit down and with us right away. Uh, I have personally reached out several times. We as a city administration have reached out as of, well, we started two weeks ago indicating what our negotiation target would be, what we're willing to negotiate over, and and you'll see it's a public document as of today. It's a pretty expansive range of issues. We're willing to negotiate everything from retirement to pensions. And ultimately, as the union contract comes up this year, we'll be negotiating on pay. We actually have money allocated for pay increase. These gentlemen do not represent the union. Well, where's that so, person tonight? So I don't want to speak for them. I know they, they don't want to speak well, for them. Well, they're all members, aren't they, of the POA? Can't they respond? Uh, I, I don't think they're authorized to respond on behalf of the police union. And in fact, they're in management, which makes it a little more challenging. But so what's that guy's email address? <laughs> <laughs> so where is that gentleman this evening? What's that? Is he the one preventing our homes from being burglarized or not? Look, I'm not in the business of pointing fingers. I want to solve problems. We're ready to negotiate. We're ready to move forward. And we're going to do everything we can, particularly the officers here are working very hard just to, to do everything they can to address this burglary. But we'll, we'll, we'll be on the phone. Uh, Hello? Let, me, let me let you know that Hello? before we continue with the question, please, um, I know that it's after 8.30 and our panel has uh, let me know that they will stay as long as it takes. They will take all the questions and answer all of your questions. Uh, so please stay um, and be patient. We'll get to you. So uh, we'll go to the next question. Mayor, Mayor, I have a question. Okay. Burglars. That's a big problem in the Almond Valley. But another problem that's starting is homeless people in the parks. There's a homeless person living in the park right down by the library on Camden. And when I've called 911, uh, the police have come out and responded and they've told me he's harmless. Just let it go. So now, I just let it go, and now he's moved down a block by the hair place, <laughs> by uh, Camden and uh, Almaden. Okay, I went in there, I complained, and I called 911, and I was told, is he threatening you? I said, no, he's not threatening me. Okay. He's not threatening me, but he's a homeless guy living in the park right off uh, Camden. So what can be done about that? Thank, thank you for your question. The one thing that I really want to stress, uh, just on, working in all parts of the city, uh, is that being homeless is not a problem. Thank you. And so as a police department, we will deal, and that's why you asked us questions, with the critical aspects that may come about from someone being homeless, but simply someone being homeless without a home is, is not a crime, and quite frankly, it's something with all the issues that we have that we have to respond to, doesn't give the priority that other the other issues do. And so it's a it's a you know it's an issue that I think citywide uh, we're we're grappling with, quite frankly. But as far as from a, from a, that we have to work collaboratively together to solve. But the police can't be the answer to for you know to taking care of, to have to respond out if someone doesn't have a home. So we'll deal with the crimes that occur, and obviously we'll respond out as we can, but that's where the priority, that's where we put the place that priority in order to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Licardo? Hey, Mr. Mayor? Mayor Lord, on this side, I think. Um, two quick questions. Uh, last I checked, San Jose has about the lowest per capita income of any city in the valley. Why? And what can we do about it? We're competing against these cities to hire officers. Make more money! No, but I'm just saying, it seems to be a land use issue. And I'm just saying, we're a bedroom community. Palo Alto is not. Uh, they seem to be hiring a lot of our officers. Second question is, how many officers sworn will be on the force at the end of your first term? Give me the easy question. Uh, so I'll just tell you, in response to the, uh, the second question, a lot more. 
Uh, we're encouraging we can. Look, the target we set through this negotiating target was to get to 1,250 officers. And so to do that, we need about $83 million of funding to do that, plus all the other things we want to do to restore payment maintenance, all the basics of the city that have been ignored through this recession because we don't have the money. So we're hoping through negotiation uh, and through a lot of other things, we're going to try to get to that target of 1,250. Uh, can I say we're going to do it in the first term? Probably not. I think that's it's going to be, take several years. Uh, secondly, with regard to uh, the, uh, the housing jobs balance. Yeah, so we are the only major city in the country that has more people at nighttime than daytime, right? But most big cities are job centers. We are a veteran community for the rest of the valley. And this is not just a recent phenomenon. Back in the 1970s when Janet Gray Hayes was mayor and they passed the first general plan, which is the blueprint for development in the city, they said, how are we gonna get more jobs in here because we're the only big city in America with fewer people working than, than living. So, so this is no longer a problem. Uh, what about the well, Tashi project? Right. Right. So that's a recent. Right. So what we have done since 2007, with I believe two exceptions, and that was one of them, was halted the conversion of industrial and employment land. That's commercial land, industrial land. The conversion of that to housing, because housing developers are chewing it up and building lots of projects and making lots of money, and it was good for them, bad for the city. Uh, so, uh, you, can, you can be assured, since I was the chair of the General Plan Task Force, to ensure that we have a halt on that, uh, we're not going to be converting uh, more land uh, for housing. Uh, we are going to be building more housing because we need housing along with lots of other things. But really, we've got to focus on how we can help small companies grow here and stay here and add jobs here. A lot of people think it's all about bringing companies in. That makes headlines, but that's not where the job growth is in the city. 95% of our job growth in this valley is from small companies getting bigger. And so that's why I spent a lot of time talking to local CEOs about how we can ensure they're scaling here and they're adding jobs here instead of Austin or San Francisco or anywhere else. Uh, that's a very complex answer I can give you offline about permitting and all that we're doing to try to ensure that we have a place where employers want to be. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, so, so you, we keep referring to this five billion or whatever it is unfunded pensions. We keep three billion. We keep sweeping under the carpet. If we hire so many more officers and still keep these pensions so high, how can we possibly ever get out of the hole? So my question is this: Why don't we invite the union? Police unions to these meetings. Yes. Amen. Not the policemen, the police unions, because the bottom line is I bet you there's got to be a lot of people in this room who would who would large who would like to take the non police jobs of the police force, all the desk jobs. There's a lot of technical people who would work for half the salary and twenty percent pension. Like really <laughs> Sir, you know, honestly, as you know, probably I was a strong advocate for police, uh, for, uh, for pension reform across the workforce. Obviously, you know, we went through a very painful battle in 2012, passed uh, Measure B. Uh, we now are trying to deal with the consequences. The good news is we're no longer laying people off. We're no longer shrinking their services. We're slowly restoring. The bad news is we're having a very hard time retaining police officers. So we've got some difficult work ahead, and I intend to do everything we can to make this a sustainable system without adding a cent to that unfunded liability. While, and what ultimately where I'd like to go is we're going to be really retaining folks, really focusing on the pay line rather than pension line, because uh, that's, those are dollars we can all count and keep track of today. My name is Nadia Chowdhury, and I live in Alvinan, and I've been a resident for the past eight years. And my concern is that on January 24th, I was on my way to Costco and Whole Foods, and as I came out of Lace River Way on Trinidad, I saw a car that looked similar to a police car, but it wasn't. It was all white with really dark tinted windows. And right away, I turned on to Hallwood, and I called 311, uh, that's not an emergency number, 
and they said to me that they're going to try their best, but you know they can't promise that they will come around and look at this car. I called my husband, who then called 311 to report the same incident, and they had asked him, he was homesick, and they asked him to go take a picture and since I was driving and I, I left. But he came, took a picture of the car around 6 p.m., and I still have it in my phone. And the lady on the line, 311, asked him to get out of the car and go peek in to see if anybody was sitting This threw me off. I said I should have, she should have told me this and I would have told This is ridiculous. She asked us, my husband, to come out of the car and peek in. And I, my husband said, well, you cannot peek through because it's, they're so dark. It was obvious it was not from our neighborhood. And stay home, Mom. I know all the cars on my street, and I knew that wasn't it. The very next day, behind that, where that car was, there was a gang symbol. And as I was driving, I came home. I run a daycare. I asked my neighbor, can you go and take a picture? I have it in my phone. If you'd like, you can. Yeah, it's January 24th, and the game symbol was on January 25th. Now, with all the crimes and robberies that happened taking place in this neighborhood, There's I no thought backup. you guys would make an effort to come out. No Today, backup. however, I did no see a police car on Lake Burger Way, and I actually waved on them before. Yeah. That's the first time I've seen them in over a year. And that's my concern. Is that the correct I'm protocol? Sure is that what we're supposed to do with Bill Wynn? No. I mean, that's ridiculous. So I might have to go back and review yeah. that with a call. Yeah, for please, her, yeah. Me, call it's my word again. <laughs> but I mean, we, we record all the calls that we take. So Wonderful. We don't, uh, January 24th, 24, uh, 2015. The, the bigger issue, um, obviously, on top of that, if that's, if obviously, we're not, we shouldn't be telling someone to go into harm's way. Right? Yes, and, I, and that's what I thought when you said that you guys hired the best of the best. <laughs> Very ignorant comment. You know, you know, if, if, if it's something that we did, uh, you have to sit cast the first bill. I think people make mistakes. I was sitting there thinking, should I bring it up? Should I bring it up? I was talking to my neighbor. She said, go up there, bring it up. This is important. And I have proof right here. Well, I mean, the issue and is. And I'd like to show you the up. picture of the car. I have with no license plate, by the way. No license plate. So that would see if you guys aren't next door. I sent out an urgent alert that evening around 5.30. And I went to Holton's, I went to Costco, I came back, the car was still there. I said, this is ridiculous. Nobody came to check up on it. Let me just stop for this. And there are gang symbols, there's still gang symbol right at the junction of Lazy River Way and Trinidad, across from Lazy River Way on the other side. There's a house with a white fence. It's right there. It's been there almost a month now. For three weeks. Okay. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, okay, with the, if the if the graffiti's there, then we need to we have a I'll excellent I believe you. You can try where it's at and we'll take care of it. As far as the car, um, quite frankly, what you just described to me is what we call a suspicious vehicle. It is. Okay. But, okay. Well, in our in our scheme of what the responsibilities we have and our bandwidth with staffing, that doesn't qualify as a very high priority call, unfortunately. But, but they, but they, but yes, exactly. Given the number of crimes that have been happening in Almaden Valley, and they said that they will see if you have, if we had one dispatcher in Almaden Valley, they would have come out to see. They would have come out to check. We have, we pay really high taxes here. I moved to Almaden Valley eight years ago. My, so my I want this. I want the money that we pay in. Uh, I'm sorry, the house cash? Well, uh, you know what, excuse me, I'm just going to interrupt you here. There's a lot of other people with questions. If I can just, if you can just limit it to your question, we can get uh, a lot further. Thank you. Can I respond very briefly? Uh, first, based on what you told us, it sounds like the dispatcher made a big mistake. So, uh, shame on us, I'm sorry. Uh, secondly, with regard to the, the response, uh, let me just tell you bluntly, these guys are absolutely stretched. And they're responding to violent crimes as a high priority. And suspicious vehicles, though may well have been a future crime in progress, we, we, I'm sure we can agree that that's quite possible. Uh, they're responding to a knife, right? And, and that's the priority they have to give. Uh, we, are this, the, we have the, the lowest violent crime rate in the United States among major cities. 
And we have that in part because the police department prioritizes violent crime. And I think that is probably what we all agree to do. Just Man. one, just one, one additional Man. comment that I'm gonna that I'm gonna that I'm gonna make. You need to understand, and I, what I can understand is the police department uh, with the comment you made about you know because you the taxes that you pay and what you expect. We're blind to that. We have responsibility to over a million residents of the city, every part of the city, and we have to get fired. We have to treat every crime that happens in the entire city the exact same. <laughs> okay, Mayor, I have a question for you. You mentioned three times that you are broke. I mean, we are broke. <laughs> so the question is very straightforward. I am too. <laughs> the question is very straightforward. How are you going to lead the city out of the broke? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so if you go online the city website, you'll see what our plan is for the restoration of services here uh, over the next five years. And it relates to that $83 million figure I referred to. Uh, it's going to have to be through a combination of everybody making sacrifices. And, and uh, I'm happy to talk in great detail about that plan, but fundamentally, we need more revenue, right? So we need more employers, because as much as we love you as residents, employers pay more taxes, and they don't demand much in services. Uh, so we love employers. Um, residents, Contrary to what you might believe, although you pay more than your share of taxes, everyone pays plenty of taxes, but in fact, every resident consumes more in city services than they pay in taxes because most of those tax dollars go to a school district, a state, a county, or somewhere else. We get about a penny of your sales tax out of that eight, seven years, wherever we are, just a little less than nine cents. We get about 12% of your property tax. All the other money goes to other government entities. So, it's the folks that's got to be on jobs. That's why when I represent the downtown, it was all about how can we get more companies in downtown. The last year and a half, we've done pretty well. We've got about 35 tech companies moving to downtown a year and a half. Uh, and we got to just do more of that throughout the city. But obviously, we've got an economic tailwind now, and now's the time for us to, to keep pushing. I think you're going to hear a lot of good news in the next few weeks. You're going to hear about a direct flight to China, which is a big economic driver for our city. You hear about direct flights to Dallas. We just got also a big economic driver. Uh, you're going to hear about uh, companies in North San Jose that are expanding and moving in. So this is a good time. That's good news. I'm going to keep driving that news. Um, I have a question for the mayor. Uh, there are a couple of things I take with me from tonight's meeting. The first is that in the short term, we shouldn't expect much in the way of uh, personnel expansion, police personnel expansion. But we also happen to all live in the short term. Yes. Um, the second thing I take out of it is that uh, a particular concern is the, not, the low retention rate of the academy. And I assume those are budgeted positions, that those individuals, if they graduated and became uh, members of the police force, uh, would would have budget allocations for them. Has any given that situation? Has any consideration been given to the possibility of contracting with the sheriff's department to provide uh, filling uh, services, in particularly in this area? Uh, short answer is yes. We are considering these things, and I think Eddie can probably speak to it better than I can. But I can tell you, we have been reaching out in various ways to try to engage uh, sheriffs and uh, other departments, like San Jose State University as a police department, for example, uh, in, uh, in coordinating better. Uh, I can tell you, a few years ago, while I was on the BTA board, uh, we wish, for example, to get more sheriff's deputies along the transit corridors. Uh, so those are things where the sheriffs have a responsibility now for transit, under contract BTA and county buildings, and we want them to do more patrolling there because we know there's a fair amount of time that's connected to those transit stations. Yeah, there's areas of the responsibility of the sheriff's office has currently. Uh, there's a lot of county buildings, VTA, as the mayor mentioned, throughout the entire city. If, if you know, quite frankly, we've had conversations with them for them to take over just their buildings 24-7. You know, their buildings, their property, 24-7. There's some contract limitations, there's a mission with BTA, but if, if they were to do that, that would assist us greatly. 
There are some other units that we're looking at, uh, perhaps if we can get some help for special operations that, that we simply been talking about, whether it's traffic, traffic enforcement is a good example, to see how we can bolster and get some help in the traffic enforcement. I certainly, as a resident of the city, I will say this, and I guess I'm biased, but uh, patrolling my streets in the city of San Jose, I never want to see anything but a San Jose police officer. And so that's what we're continuing to strive for, and that's really got to be the answer. That, that, that's got to be the ultimate goal. So there's maybe some little things that some outside agencies can do, but in the end, the core work, and I guarantee you all of you, the core work that you want to see done in your city is by a San Jose police officer. Mr. Mayor? Uh, so I'm getting the feeling that, on your right, I'm getting the feeling that a lot of people are blaming Measure B for this current mess. Uh, is the council intending to violate the letter and spirit of the overwhelmingly passed Measure B? No. Uh, what I've been very explicit about, is now a public document so I can speak more freely about it, uh, is that we need to go back to the ballot. Uh, that is, uh, there are issues, for example, uh, around the definition of disability that are creating great anxieties for new officers to join the department. Well, we need to address that. We need to probably change that definition. I know we need to change the definition so that officers don't feel anxious about whether or not they're protected, they're hurting the line of duty. Uh, and then we need to go back to the ballot and get voter approval for it because it's in the charter now. And uh, I am hopeful that we'll be able to negotiate quickly, get the issue resolved so everybody is clear about what the intent is on both sides of this debate, uh, and then go to the ballot and get voter approval. I have a question. Let me start with the remarks. Thanks for coming out here, and thanks for your great to stay longer. Uh, second, I hope that uh, you're taking all the, the presence and all the questions as a sign of support from your constituents, and to, you know, to be able to do something, to go up there and say, you know, we've had a room full of people, and you all wanted this, and hopefully that's going to happen. Fair said you all have made a statement Thank you. by your presence. So we're not, we're not getting up at you, we're just supporting you. Um, but I have another question. So one of the things of, uh, that hasn't gone unnoticed is that this recent wave of crime has started or has coincided at the very least with the release of uh, people uh, from prisons onto the streets. And uh, so I was wondering how many of the uh, people have, who have been caught were, have been released as a result of, for example, in Proposition 47. And uh, so we're not blaming you for that. People who were in favor of it probably take some of the blame, but the program was sold to the voters as the Californians for a safer for safer schools and neighborhoods. And I just was wondering, uh, what is how many people were are on the streets now because of the reasons? Right. So uh, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but I'll I'll play one for a moment. Uh, I think Prop 47 is too recent, so it's it's too early to tell. What we did see with the realignment that occurred back in roughly 2011, where we saw uh, a release of, I can't remember the number, 32,000 inmates statewide, uh, was we saw spikes in property crime in cities throughout the state. And San Jose was no different. We saw a spike in Sunnyvale where they didn't lose any officers. Since 2012, we've seen a reduction in property crime. Uh, and uh, for a couple of years, we've seen that reduction by the as well. And so there's no question there was a spike around the time there was a significant realignment. The realignment for everybody knows is basically folks who were in the state pen were going to the counties. The counties were doing various things. In some cases they were putting them in jail. In some cases, most cases they were being supervised by probation officers in the community. And obviously some of them were committing crimes. And so that's what we grapple with as a city. Uh, whatever Washington sneezes or Sacramento uh, pops, we, we get full. Which would we support repeal of Prop 47? Uh, again, Prop 47 is too early to tell what the impact is. Uh, I didn't support it because I thought there were particular uh, areas. Uh, for example, if someone is uh, in possession of a gun, uh, I believe that needs to be charged as a felony. The former DA I care a lot about that. I was concerned about provisions like that. Um, I'm very data oriented, and so I kind of have an idea. Um, I, I noticed in your chart, you know, there was that big peak between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And I also had the unfortunate experience of having a stranger inside of my house um, just over a year ago. My question is, 
you know, I'm a stay-at-home person because I have a disability, but there's a lot of other people like me and stay-at-home parents. Um, can you harness our stay-at-homeness? Is, is, is there a way that we can be linked into a website and show pictures of suspicious vehicles that we notice while walking our dog or looking out of our window? Like my husband here just saw a suspicious car. 311 doesn't always work. So, so the question is... It's, well, it's two parts. One, is there a creative way to harness the stay-at-home network of people? And two, is there a better way than 311 of getting the data of pictures and typed in words of suspicious vehicles and people that we see? Are you using Nextdoor? Yes. You are on Nextdoor? What we're, we're working with our IT department is see if we can create a neighborhood dashboard for folks who want to post photos or videos or comments. For example, I live east of downtown, as you can imagine, we have challenges to get to a crime. Uh, and, you know, if there's a drug house, for people to be able to record their observations and have other residents within that network and that neighborhood be able to understand what they're seeing and communicate with one another. So what about him? What about well, a couple of things. One, one of the things, if you see, if you see something, say something. Okay, because regardless whether the police can respond right away or not, we keep track of where issues are so that we can deploy officers and know where some of the hot spots are. The other is, is things like next door. Oh, but now I'm responding on three sites. That one, next door, and yours. Yes. <laughs> also, also, you know, Grace and Daniel and, and, and I have worked together on many, many neighborhood watch pieces. Those, I think, are the most effective. We had one and you came. Thank yes, you. And, 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 uh, and I think those are actually, so you got to know your neighbors. You met them, uh, some of them for the first time, right? Some of them? Some of them. Right. And so I think a lot of them are probably thanking you for being the lookout of the neighborhood. But that is, that is one of the great ways. And I think until we get some more software, and I think the mayor and I are very, very pro electronic solutions. And we are trying to look at ways on improving service through that kind of stuff. Put that hat on and think of me as an untapped resource. How yeah. many other people in the house between 10 and 2? Yeah, I agree. And that's a great resource. Eyes and ears are what keep us safe, so thank you. Uh, and specifically, what I was referring to was a way to integrate next door with C-Click Fix and other visual platforms so people can readily see what's going on in their neighborhood in a, in a spatial dimension so they understand what's going on with that problem or drug house, etc. I have a question for Chief Garcia. <coughs> I was actually going to ask you a question, Chief Garcia. Um, however, I think I'm just going to make a statement because uh, I already know the answer to the question. Sorry. Bottom line, folks, is uh, measure B, good or bad, has drastically affected your police department. And as such, they are they are leaving. They are fleeing. And at this point, you're having a difficult time retaining them and not recruiting them. Yes, I am a retired officer. So uh, I don't know whether that's good or bad in this crowd. Um, bottom line, is really not a question. <clears throat> You need to fix what's been done with Measure B, otherwise you're not going to be retaining your cops. When a city starts dying, if it can't retain its police, it will, it will die. And since I retired in 2007, we have gone from over 14 off 1,400 officers on the day I retired to less than 900 cops. It's bleeding, bleeding cops. I'm just being told the time is up. Really, no question. Thank you for allowing me. Yeah, just to be clear, we lost over 400 officers over that period of time. 320 of them were lost in the total officer count before Measure B passed. We were broke. We lost a lot so, of them. So, sorry, my next question is very Don't different. Don't believe me. So, you look it up. Very different direction. I hear a lot of discussion of the uh, symptoms, but I think we need to discuss the root cause. No matter how many police we have, if the drew now out of the prison for three days, it doesn't matter how many we have. So my question is, what's the educational program we have for those juveniles? 
the, the lead the lead and the peers are studying hard for the college, but those kids are enjoying breaking in people's house. So before we release them out from the prison or whatever, um, do we contact the school? Is there educational program with their family? What kind of uh, innovative program we can have to prevent the similar stuff happening? Uh, as you might expect, uh, juveniles get involved in uh, gang activity, crime activity, because often there is not an adult who's deeply involved in their life. And sometimes it's because mom's holding down two jobs and dad had headed for the hills a long time ago. Uh, and so we need to find a lot of other ways for as a community to get in there and reach the kid. And uh, I'm pushing for all kinds of different approaches. Uh, I know, for example, a child can succeed in school when they have an opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, program with a caring adult in a routine way. And so we launched a program called Thousand Hearts with Thousand Minds, where we could engage volunteers in our many brilliant, uh, many brilliant minds in our workforce uh, to tutor a child. Uh, once a week, an hour a week. They usually ask for come in about 12 weeks at least. And uh, in, in existing programs, we have great nonprofit programs throughout the city. Uh, we've managed to get over 500 tutors involved in that program. And I want to scale it. This year, we're going to relaunch it and see if we can expand it significantly. Uh, fundamentally, it's about reaching the child before the games do. And you know, you make a good point. And let's face it, these are our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to let you know, ever since, since I've been in office, I've been working with uh, um, several groups, nonprofit organizations, to, to create after school programs uh, for youth. And um, uh, one of them is the YMCA, who actually also is, has created a, um, a summer program for at risk youth as well. So um, a lot of the funds, that the excess funds, funds from my office that I have, I've actually devoted give them a large chunk of that money so they can continue those programs. Also, I want, I want you to know that the solution for the crime, the criminals coming out and not being rehabilitated as much as they could, if, you know, with that, we need to ask our state legislators uh, to, to devote more money, devote more time. Emma Lowe's staff, I don't know if they're still here, but they were here today. Um, look, and uh, there's a, another representative. If you're in Alabama, you actually have two state assembly members that represent you, uh, Mark Stone, and Evan Lowe, you can write letters, please do, asking them uh, to fulfill their promise of rehabilitating those folks before you release them out on the streets. I would, I would actually welcome this. And I was really, I wanted to say I'm really proud of the turnout that came out here today. Really, really proud of all of you. Uh, all of you actually helped me uh, bring attention to our community and our concerns, and I want to thank all of you for doing that. Uh, but, but we need to keep working on things, making sure our state legislators make decisions that, that, that affect our community, when they make decisions that affect our community, are giving us the resources to deal with it. Um, and and, and uh, if you can reach out to your state legislatures and make sure that our, our, um, our rehabil rehabilitation services are bolstered, I would appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask you, with your expertise and your analysis and research, um, we've looked at the past crime crimes and the current crimes I'm wanting to know a little bit about the future. When you take an antibiotic and you don't use it fully, your illness can come back. If we kind of bring up forces and, you know, like you said, at the end of the month, we're going to have to pull back a little bit, does that play in the mind of the criminal, like their psychology? Would they turn from burglars to robbers? And my worry is, have we seen any trends like that, either in California or in the area in the US, where all of a sudden that would change? Because that's fearful. As a One of the things that we do look at is what does the future look like? And with predictive analytics, we try to decide what will happen, say, with truancy, with a minor that does not engage in school. How many of our prisoners have been in high school dropouts? So that's something that's predictable, I think. So it's something that we work on with the truancy abatement program. It's something that we're working on in Southern Division to work with the schools to get the kids back in school. And if they're not engaged in the wraparound services or uh, the services that the schools provide, then we can relatively predict if they're 
probably be engaged in some type of criminal activity, or things that they should not be doing. So, to answer part of your question, yes, there are some things that we can predict. There are some things that we're working on that we can currently work on. With our SAR process, working with the schools to get the twins back in the school, and to work with the Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force to get them services. That's one thing that we look at. Um, there's some things that we can't predict. Will the uh, rate of uh, a criminal that comes out, will he continue to be a criminal or will he be reformed? So that's something that, I guess as a society, <coughs> not that the police can fix that, it's something that we have to look at. Right. But do criminals change over from being burglars to robbers? I mean, when they frustrated enough that they're like, we started to break in, that worked for us for a while, now we're going to take it to the next level and come armed. Like, does that happen? It's like, how do you think that things change? Well, I can say this. We have criminals that may steal a car, and they may commit a robbery, burglary. There's different types of criminals. You have those that become professional criminals. You have uh, criminals that are uh, uh, addicted to narcotics that may break into your home. So it, it's hard to say. I have a question. My question is to the mayor. And um, I, I've been a long-time resident, 36 years here. I own two houses in Amadan Valley. And uh, first of all, thanks to the, all the officers that have showed up. And, uh, and, and thanks to all the rank and file for all the protection they do give us. But we're still wanting more. So if I look up on the internet, it tells me that for our size city, we should have anywhere between 1,500 and 1,700 police officers. And we got at best eight, because there's usually 150, 200 that are, that are off at any one time. So my question is, that first of all, I was a, a union negotiator for management for many years. And sitting down and talking with the union is one thing, but you have to cultivate that relationship first before you sit down, you just don't throw something on the table and say you didn't come to the table and talk to me. So that's one point. I, I agree. Second of all, is that what's happening, if, if we're saving money on uh, five or 600 officers that should be on the street, what are we doing with that money? You're not saving uh, money on five or 600 officers should be on the street. Uh, we decided long ago we could only afford 1,109 officers. I understand right. that. So, so that one is already spoken for. Okay. I, that's what my question uh, what is. What we are doing is we're building reserve that we're willing to use for everything uh, from, you know, we've expressed as a council willingness to use it for incentives for hiring, uh, to pay increases, to, uh, uh, I know there was a program, the uh, PSRP that was earlier referred to. Uh, there are a host of programs that we're quite willing to spend money on to help us improve our retention and traction of officers. We need to be able to have somebody on the other side of the negotiation table be able to negotiate. Just one quick. The question that you that you asked, are you asking basically we're allocated 1109, like I explained earlier, we're less than that. You're asking where that money no, I'm asking not, not not that, because I know where that money goes. Okay. But I'm talking about that if you were fully staffed it, at the, the levels that you should be. And I understand that there's reasons why you've chosen not to do that. But you're saving money on public safety. And my question is, where's the money going? If it's not going to public safety, as you said, it's already been spoken for and used somewhere else. My question is, is where's it being spent? Public safety should be taken care of first. Second of all, you should then figure I'm out. Sure you that the share of the budget, the discretionary budget, for public safety has only increased over the last decade. Uh, we are not diverting public safety money for other uses. And so I want to be absolutely clear about that. We do have a reserve that's been created in the police department for use of overtime and for some of those other issues I described where we'd be ready and willing to be able to offer the sentence and other means to be able to improve our retention and, and attraction. But there's no shifting of dollars. And frankly, uh, the fact that we had, for example, vacancies uh, in past years, uh, the reality is we probably didn't have enough money to pay all the officers at full, at full, uh, at full staff. Uh, 
Uh, so, as you know, we're not we're not spending on paving your streets because your streets don't look very good right now. We're not spending on your libraries because your libraries are only open four and a half days a week. So I can tell you, there's no magic slush fund. I encourage you all to come down uh, on March the March the seventh. Seven. 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 Yeah, thank you, Paul. March the seventh, we're going to have uh, the first of our uh, community gatherings to talk about the budget. You can hear a lot of numbers. We're going to be engaging in how, so we can all better understand where your dollars are going and better prioritizing so we can ensure that your highest priorities, particularly safety, are funded. Uh, hi. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you're, you know, we've been talking about how hard, how hard it is to, um, you know, hire police because of the um, constraints on the budget or the pay rates, right? The pay that we would offer them. But you also talked about like um, the standards of the San Jose police and needing like college education. Like, why do I care if the police has a college education or not? I mean, why wouldn't that be something that might we look at as a way to get more police here at San Jose? Because is it really that critical that a police person has a college education? Well, one of the things that I'll say, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we're one of the most well-educated police forces, not just in California, but in the nation. As a citizen, I'm proud of that. One of the things that that also leads to is you know, the issues that happen outside the scenes, possible corruption issues, internal affairs issues, those type of things that occur in a lot of other agencies that you know we've had our issues here, but don't don't occur here. And quite frankly, you know you have some of the smartest and brightest investigators and police officers that are working the streets, and that's one of the things that separates us. It's one of the reasons why we mentioned earlier that we understand we'd like to be. I'm mean, at 11 or 9 right now. Uh, you know, I've been to major city chiefs conferences where the city of Austin, as an example, with less people, has 1,700 police officers. Right? Well, we've never been there. We're the 10th largest city in the country. We've never had that. Okay? We're we want to be staffed at a level that is commensurate to the work that we do, which is what we're asking for. But the reason why we've always been one of the safest cities when we're at those staffing levels is because of the caliber of officer that you have. And that goes back to the standards that we have, and it starts with the education. Yeah. Okay, folks, it's uh, getting time to break. Um, folks, if you want to close it up, so I'm going to just take uh, this gentleman and one other question that was over here. Is that correct? Okay. Hi, my name is Philip Laidlaw. I've been a resident here for over 20 years. I'm Mayor Lecard, I'm Supervisor Camus and the Command Staff. I've met most of you in one of the pipers for the Sheriff's Office uh, organizations I've met you police weeks and things like that. I appreciate you guys coming out here. I was one of the people outside that was really upset that we couldn't get in, but we're really passionate about this. My street has had four robberies in the last 45 days. Two nights ago, there were three break-ins of cars, one was stolen. Okay, we're under siege. <laughs> really, seriously. And I get, I get, I get the restraint and everything, but there's not a person in this room when there was 2,500 people in this room that hasn't taken a pay cut and isn't paying more into their retirement. This needs to be fixed. My 15 year old daughter is afraid to be in my house. That's completely ridiculous. I volunteer 40 days a year for law enforcement. I was an EMT as a volunteer for 10 years. I'm a good guy. I'm asking for your help. In Almaden Valley, we're asking for an unfair share of resources because we do our job. When the murder happened in Guadalupe Oaks Park, four of us had the license plate before the crime was committed. We helped the officers, descriptions, cars, license numbers, the whole deal. When we're doing our job, we need some freaking air cover. We need air two back in the air, we need to star one back in the air to clear the parks. Because those people are up in those parks, from the top of the Guadalupe Oak Park, you can see the whole top of the Almaden Valley. And they can say, car's coming, get out of the house. My neighborhood, they went house to house to house. Thank you. I do really appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys. Uh, a few months ago, I did ask the sheriff for uh, a 
helicopter, uh, well, helicopter service over our parks. And I've actually gotten complaints that we have helicopters uh, flying over. I had several complaints call me up. This neighborhood is, you know, under siege with helicopters. So, so the issue is, life flight comes up from St. Rose Hospital in Gilroy, the EMT. It comes up high speed at night and low altitude because they're trying to get people to Stanford or to BMC. That's a different helicopter than Air 2 or Star 1. Air 2 and Star 1 are almost silent at night. When the, when the Eurocopter 45 comes up from St. Rose, it's flying close to 200 miles an hour, and it's noisy. That's what people are hearing. Okay, well, and, and, and just to let you know, the city council is not sitting around thinking, we don't want to negotiate with, with our unions. We, we, ever since I've been in city council, I have wanted to negotiate with our unions. There's not a single day where I, not a single Tuesday, that we didn't talk about trying to negotiate with our unions. Uh, there's been some real bad blood between our previous mayor uh, and, and the unions. I don't know what the situation was. I didn't cause Measure B to get into this situation. A lot, all the city council members that are currently on the city council did not put us in the financial situation that we are currently facing. We are trying to dig this, us out. And I want to make absolutely clear that our current council is trying to undo some of the, the, the disastrous spending decisions that were made on previous councils. And we have been, our door has been open. We, are, we have sent letters back and forth to our police officers. Though that information is all online. Almost every Tuesday we sent letters asking them to come to the table. Don't take my word for it. I'm a politician. Go online. See what we've done. See the kinds of offers that we've made. And see, see you know, I'm just letting you know, we're frustrated too. Our council members are frustrated too because we want to go to somebody at the other side of the table. And I just want to let you know that I, I'm hoping that this mayor and this current new uh, POE leadership will start putting the, the community's best interest in heart instead of other interests. Are we going to meet the new guy? Are we going to meet the new officer in charge of the Almond Valley? So I did. Want, I, you know, this is. I, I, was there one more question? Or yes. one, one more? One more question. Okay. All right. As soon as as soon as the last question got, I went. I was going to introduce him. I'm sorry to have to make you wait this long. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Catherine, and I'm actually a student from Newland High School, and I'm also a member of the journalism committee here, and so. Um, if, if it's possible, I'd like to actually use this response as a quote in the student newspaper. But I was wondering, um, since we talked earlier about how a lot of the people that actually commit these burglaries are students, I was wondering um, what can we do on the part of students and teachers and administrators to solve this burglary problem? That's an interesting question, quite frankly, because you know, one of the things that we talked about with our TAP program, which is truancy of the burglary suppression, is the fact that we need them to be in school. So, you know, to the extent that you know we can we can keep these kids in school and school administrators can find different ways to get kids that are underwater and feel like there's nowhere to go, so they just don't come to school because they're down so many credits. Find more innovative ways to get them back into the school environment. That would definitely, that would definitely assist. Uh, obviously, passing on information to your friends. I mean, we talk about, you know, there's a great, great percentage that are that are kids in school, but there's also a great percentage that aren't. All right. So the extent is you, the is your students are the best eyes and ears we have. If you see something, say something. And you know, like, everyone knows, you know, who's, you know, who knows doing what in their school. You know, I have uh, high school age kids that, uh, as well. They know who's up to up to no good in schools, and have being eyes and ears and telling someone if you hear or see something. But again, you know, from a school administration standpoint, really try to keep these kids in school. And I know for a fact that one of the reasons you know some kids are truly when they're eventually short is because there's no hope for them. They feel like they're just down so many credits by even showing at all. And so those are we have to come up with some innovative ways that we can just keep these kids in school. So at this time, I'd like to actually thank everybody for, for being here today. I would like to introduce our new captain for our, 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 uh, our division. Uh, Southern Division is what we're called. It includes more than Alameda Valley, by the way. If you saw the maps earlier, if you 
Uh, it, it's a much bigger area than just Amadeus, but I want to give him a couple minutes to, to introduce himself. And I just feel very fortunate to be here. My name is Ed Schroeder. I'm uh, a lieutenant until Sunday, and I will take over the Southern Division captain on Sunday. So uh, I have big shoes to fill, literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> captain Williamson, be Deputy Chief Williams, and I go back. We went to the pad together. Well, it, uh, as I went with uh, Lieutenant Messi and Lieutenant Kinger. So um, we have a really good synergy working together. Um, that's a good start. Coming here today, walking in was pretty overwhelming. Um, I expected some numbers here. I know it's a huge issue. Uh, it, it was overwhelming. And, it, and truthfully, it, it just shows your dedication. It shows what each and every one of you feel about the situation and about your home and about what you want to do to help protect yourselves. And I totally get it. I do. I feel for every one of you, you all those hands went up at the beginning when asked if your house has been rigorized. Uh, heartbreaking, honestly. As a, as a young child, several times, um, actually my house was broken into also. And, and, I, and I understand what you're saying about your child. It's, it's awful. And um, we don't want anyone to go through that. Um, I think it was uh, Chief Garcia that said, one burglary is committed. We get it. I'm a realist, though, so, and things do happen. We're going to do everything we can to help continue to work on the problem you're having here. I can promise you that. Um, in addition, like uh, Councilman Thomas was saying, in addition to this area, I do have a lot of other responsibilities. However, we are dedicated to helping you out. We don't want to see you living like this. We don't want to see you living in fear. And we want to enlist your support and your help and your collaboration to help assist us in our mission. Uh, the reality is, staffing-wise, it's an issue. It really is. It truly is. But um, just the other day, we had a meeting of, uh, prior to this as a pre-meeting with uh, Chief Garcia and Chief Escobel and a couple other command staff uh, level members of the department. And we talked about other, what other solutions, other things we can do to help. Uh, clearly, we're doing everything we, we possibly can at the time. Um, it was being done uh, with what we have. But we want to start looking at different solutions as well. So these are all things that I'm going to be working on. I'm going to work with Councilman Kevin and Bear. And we will be uh, doing everything we can, I promise you. This is a very, very important issue to, to, to you, which makes it important to me, which makes it important to all these individuals here that you see that, that are taking their time to come today. Because, um, you know, a lot of us have been here since very early in the morning, and it's something we, we truly wouldn't, wouldn't miss regardless of what time this is. So um, I do look forward to our future meetings. Um, again, I'll, I'll leave you with the promise that this is uh, near and dear to my heart. It means something to me. You very, very much so impressed me with your presence your questions, and I want to do everything I can to help you guys out. So, thank you for having us.